Let's start with sort of that whole issue of you kind of being the poster child for the New York tech scene, sometimes literally. <laughs> um, you know, I know there's, there's always entrepreneurs in the Valley who say like, oh, we didn't want the hype. The hype was put onto us. And like, look, I worked at TechCrunch in the time when we wrote about Foursquare every five minutes. I know yeah. you weren't calling TechCrunch and saying, write about us every five minutes. But you were doing Gap ads. You were doing, you know, Best Buy commercials now. So how much of the hype you know, did you, did you court and how much of it was done to you? Um, I don't think we really court it. It's more like the opportunities come to us and we have to figure out, like, do we want to do the Gap ad or not? You know, do we, do we want to do the Best Buy thing or not? And a lot of it, it's, um, it's like, is it, is it good for the brand? Does this help us get the message out there so that people take, um, you know, so people start to recognize the brand and, and try to understand what we're doing. Like, no, the Best Buy thing was a, it's not something I really I was super excited about. Like the marketing group came and pitched it to me. I was like, I don't know if I want to be the guy that's in the commercial. But you know, it's like this is 30 seconds to tell the story of Foursquare and to get the logo on screen and to get people excited about what we're doing. And it's like that's you, you can't turn that stuff down. Like it's part of my job as like the lead singer for Foursquare to do that type of stuff. <laughs> Why don't? Why didn't you want to do it? I mean, are you being sort of false modest, or is there part of you that's no. really cool when you see yourself in a Best Buy commercial? I, I don't. I don't like to. It sounds like I don't like to watch the stuff. Like I'd have a hard time watching videos of me online, and like I make myself listen to them so I can kind of see like what I did good and what I did bad. Um, but I, I don't. Know, I just can't. I can't watch it. Like I'll turn away from it. You know. It's, <laughs> I, I'm not. I don't. I'm not trying to like seek that stuff out. I guess. Um, is there anything where you, at any point where you've been like, this is too much hype, we need to dial it down, I'm overexposed, is that like a word in your vocabulary? Yeah, the Best Buy ad, <laughs> you know, it was, um, I got like, I, people from, um, that I hadn't talked to uh, from high school like, for, forever, like just kind of came out of the woodwork. And the same thing with the Gap thing, like I was going, the Gap ad was out at Christmas time, and I was in the store buying like a scarf for my sister. And the girl at the Gap ad is like, oh, you the, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the guy, I'm in the, in the picture. It's like weird. It's weird. And it's like, it's just tech, right? But um, it's cool that they focus on us for doing, um, you know, for doing interesting stuff. I'm like, I don't, I, don't see, I don't mind it if it puts attention on Foursquare. I don't mind it if it puts attention on, on the New York tech scene. You know, like, I feel like that's, that's kind of our responsibility now. Like, if people want to say, hey, there's a couple big, um, you know, tech startups in New York, and Foursquare is one of the biggest, and they're the ones that are inventing the stuff. And, you know, it's helping, you know, if us making a lot of noise about what we're doing brings more VCs here and, um, you know, makes it easier for people in this room to raise money and more angels are paying attention and there's just more people, you know, like more in, just investors paying attention to the tech scene in general, like, that's good, you know, right. and like nothing bad comes out of that. Well, some um, people would feel a lot of pressure from it. I mean, some people would not want to have to be the, the sort of barometer of an ecosystem. I, um, I'll tell you what, like, if, I think this is my first time going through it, I'd have a much... I think it, more of it would have gone to my head because I'll tell you, I think some of the, the dodgeball, like we just sold dodgeball to Google right out of NYU. Like, you know, a little bit of that goes to your head and you're like, yeah, this is awesome. Look at us. We're at Google. We sold our company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like that was a, an awesome experience. But then we really got beat up after that when it didn't work out. And it just like it totally resets you. And so now that we're kind of exploring a lot of the stuff again, like this is our second chance mm -hmm. to make those ideas happen. And it's like I don't really... Like it, it's fine if people want to put a lot of attention on us, and it's great if we're gonna if it does great things for New York. But like it's it's like you have to learn not to get distracted by that stuff mm -hmm. because it gets in the way of us doing what we want to do, which is take these ideas that we've had for a long time and get them in the hands of, you know, I used to say millions of users, like tens of millions of users, a hundred million users. You know, like mm -hmm. that, this is our shot to do that, and we can't screw it up. Right. Well, let's. It's interesting what you say about you having a different outlook on it, having gone through it once before, and, and this being your second chance. Most entrepreneurs who have a second chance don't do it doing sort of the same concept and the same ideas. I mean, I think it is, it's a unique perspective. So let's talk about your first time. Okay. Tell us about what led to Dodgeball and what the ideas were then, because you weren't carrying an iPhone around. No, these are like early Dodgeball prototypes worked on, um, I mean, they were, they were, it was like a, a Samsung flip phone that I had, you know, for the kids in the room. There was no color screen, no <laughs> GPS. Like, you had to flip it open at two pieces. It would break in half sometimes. And that was considered cool. Oh, it was super cool. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, no, but, like, you know, the original dodgeball story is that, you know, I worked in the, um, uh, you know, in the dot-com days of, like, 2000 or so. And um, when all of my friends got laid off, like, there was a whole bunch of us that just, we used to all hang out after work, but then we didn't have jobs anymore. 
And so when we didn't, weren't going to work, we just weren't hanging out. I'm like, this got, we're all just hang, like, we were all just in the city loitering. And it's like, there's got to be a better way to round everyone up. So mm -hmm. it's like, someone should just be at the bar, say, I'm at Bleecker Street Bar, and I'm watching the Yankees game. Like, come by. I'm at Central Park, throwing the Frisbee around. Come by. And that's, that's the thing that we, you know, the, we built for seven of us to use, ten of us to use. And, you know, it, it worked. It worked fine for those days. And then, um, you know, worked on it for a bit, kind of put it aside for a couple of years, went back to NYU, met up with Alex. And then after a year at NYU, we decided to revisit some of those ideas. And the phones were a little bit better because they had color screens. And um, they had, it was one phone that had a camera, which is really cool, but still no <laughs> GPS, no apps. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we just kind of revisited it. The, the big difference then was, you know, Friendster had already come out. And people knew... Uh, people knew what social networks were. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm collecting my friends. Like, I would collect baseball cards or stamps. Yeah, I get that. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to build that stuff into Dodgeball and then say, yeah, but it's a social network that you take with you. I thought that was someone in the back. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a really weird crowd. He's yeah. really excited about what you're yeah, talking but, about. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it was like, that was our thing. It's like, you know, if you're that guy, you know, if you're, if you're at work spending all day long on Friendster, and then, like, you leave the office and Friendster is just there and your desk not doing any work for you. Like, that seems like a, that just seems like a waste. Uh -huh. Like, it should, you should be able to take that with you in your pocket. And it should help you when you're out in the streets and help you when you're out with your friends. Like, introduce you to people, let you know where your friends are. And, you know, that was kind of our big idea. And I think Dodgeball worked that second time coming out of NYU because people understood the social network thing. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, of course, we, we brought it to Google and we were really excited about trying to get that stuff going. But we were just, you know, I think we were a little bit ahead of our time because Google wasn't super focused on social. Um, there wasn't a lot of people that, um, you know, it was, it was cumbersome to use. You had to be a real, like, you had to be really dedicated to, to use Dodgeball, you know, mm -hmm. just because, like, it was, it was tough to use because we didn't have that, um, you know, we didn't have apps, we didn't have GPS. And then when we restarted, you know, we started um, to resurrect some of that stuff with, uh, with Foursquare, some of those ideas, like it was just a lot easier. It's like this is iPhone is the device that we wanted. We can run apps. Like people know what apps are. Those apps right. have access to maps. People understand that the phone can know where you are, and we can use that stuff to make a much richer experience. Mm -hmm. so. um, tell us about the experience um, with Google, because I know you've been pretty open about like it not being a great experience. First of all, how did that deal happen? Um, like how did it come about? Yeah, I, I just got connected with some folks at Google, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we were we were out trying to fundraise at the time. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I took a trip to Sand Hill Road, like fresh out of NYU, and I remember being there. I took like a cab from the airport, which was super expensive. And um, from just, SFO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was we had no idea what we were doing. We had no business being there, <laughs> and like, we we're trying to pitch these people, and they were just like, "You guys, like, you guys are jokers," you know. I mean, the convers to paraphrase the conversation, it's like, you know, hey, we um. We generally write checks uh, about $5 million, and we do it for you know, entrepreneurs that we really believe in, and we don't we think you're going to get one of those checks. <laughs> you know, it's just because like, we, didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. We're like, we could, if we had, imagine if we had $200,000, what we could do. And they're like, no, no, we write really big checks, right? And for really big ideas, and we don't think this is there yet. And I mean, that's totally fair. Like, we, we just, we were it was totally over our heads. We tried it. Um, eventually it, got, it didn't go well with any VC you met with. Well, we just didn't know how to talk to them, you know. Um, we just, you know, we weren't, we were coming out of art school at NYU, and, you know, people were like, what is this program? It's not, it has nothing to do with Stanford, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and, it, and it's like, it's on, it's on the other coast, it's like, it just, it just wasn't, it just, it, it just wasn't interesting to him at the time, and I think we had a hard time explaining, like, where the business was, it's like, oh, we'll figure it out, don't worry about it, like, this is something really exciting, um, but, um, yeah, so we, you know, we, we tried that for a bit, and then eventually just got hooked up with the right people at Google, and, you know, their whole thing to us was like, hey, we don't invest in companies, but you guys are super passionate about what you're doing. Like, this is a, this is a good idea. You're pretty smart about this stuff. And, like, those are the three things that we like, um, we like to have at Google. You should come work on it here. And that's, like, our dream come true because at the time, Alex and I, you know, we had just graduated. And, you know, our big idea after, at graduation was, oh, my gosh, maybe the dodgeball stuff can be our job. Like, maybe I don't have to go to, like, I was going to go take a job at MTV and he was going to go to an agency. It's like, maybe we can do our own thing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, let's go, let's try to raise money, which didn't work. And then, you know, then we got hooked up with Google and it's like, well, they're, they're going to pay us and give us health insurance and free lunch to work on the stuff that we want to work on. And this is great. Like, this, this is a great job. And right. so we were, we were super psyched about that. And when you were thinking this could, you know, be your own thing and you could do it, like, what did your parents think about that? What did your friends think about that? Because it was oh, well, certainly that's... not a period in New York where everyone did that. No, that my friends used to, um, like my friends from like the Lower East Side back in the day, they, they, they used to joke I was like the first round draft pick, 
You know, it's like, yeah, you're the one that you're the one from high school that got picked to go play on the NFL team. Like you got to go and make us proud. And so, you know, that's how they were. My, my parents were super psyched about it. And like, I'm still really proud of that. Like we were, I was like 20, maybe 27 or 20, yeah, I think 27 or so. And like we did that and I'm still, I'm still really proud of that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, of building that stuff, of, of managing it to get, it, uh, managing to get it sold. And to so, help really like popularize some of those ideas. But was it really an exit or was it more like we will give you salaries and let you do this? Oh, uh, well, I mean, in hindsight, I can, you know, I can explain it very well. Like, you know, we thought we were getting, we thought it was an acquisition, a product acquisition, and they knew that it was a aqua hire. Mm -hmm. And when those two things are out of sync, if anyone in, in here has ever had these conversations with companies, and, you know, sometimes we have these conversations with, with companies that we talk to, mm -hmm. like that's the first thing we talk about. There's two ways to do this. There's an acquisition where we take your product and we integrate it. Maybe we just rename it, whatever. And then there's an acquire hire where you retire your product and then you just, you know, you, um, you come work for Foursquare. And so I think the, the expectations were a little bit out of, out of whack when we, were, um, when we were talking to Google. They, they weren't straight with you? or you? Well, didn't I, I don't it. think they, like, we were a super small acquisition. They didn't, they didn't know how to do that, I don't think, right. at the time. This is right after their IPO. And we've never done it before. We're just like, sweet, we get jobs and health insurance and, and lunch. Right. Um, and so like, we, just, we, didn't, we didn't know what questions to ask. You uh -huh. know? And, that's, and not to go back to the whole like, poster child for New York thing, but you know, I feel like that's part of our responsibility now is to make sure that other people don't go through that experience because there's enough, enough of us talking about it and enough of us going out to coffee with people for the first time, and enough of us on stage in front of people like you so that like, everyone learns how this stuff works. You know? mm -hmm. And that's not just... Um, it's not like tech scene in general. It's like New York tech because New York tech hasn't had generations of people that have done this before. And I think right. this is probably one of the first times that there's, you know, there's, there's companies that were sold in 2000 then 2004 and then now and then in the future. Like we're on our, you know, between the like third and fourth generation of this stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, Silicon Valley is on like their 20th generation of this stuff, which is why they're so good at it. And this right. is how New York tech gets better by people learning from, you know, the processes that other people right. have gone through. You know, I think in some ways Silicon Valley has become like too institutionalized and sort of too good at this game. I mean, I've, I've written about recently, um, you know, I don't think that there's enough failure encouraged in Silicon Valley because there's so much money and there's so many, you know, connections. People engineer these soft landings all the time. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it's gotten like, it's gotten to the point where it's actually not taking risk to work at or start a company in Silicon Valley. It's actually yeah. ironically safer than going to work at a big public company. Yeah. Um, and I think that's changed a lot of the dynamic. Um, so I look at the New York scene and I actually think some of those things that are more nascent actually are kind of remind me of like the better old days of Silicon Valley. I'm, yeah. I'm curious how, how you view that. If you think well, the New just, York scene should sort of enjoy this time. No, I just think it's, it's, I think the best thing about a tech in New York is that, um, you know, tech in New York is like the, the fifth or the sixth thing that's interesting here. It's like finance and publishing and fashion and music and it's, it's everything else. And then like you can go to the bars and hang out here and it's like, oh, oh, none of you guys work in tech. That's awesome. You know, and that's great because it's like, you know, I, I thought we benefited from this in the early days where all of our friends, like none of them worked in tech mm -hmm. and we would test Foursquare on them. Hey, we built this thing. Go play with it. And they weren't like super early adopters like, no, this is garbage. This doesn't work. I don't understand this. And they were just regular people. And that was, I mean, I think that, that, that gave us a boost um, early on. I think it was an advantage. But that's one of the things I really like about the, the tech scene. It feels in New York. It's that, you know, it's just, it's not the end all be all of, of, the, of, the, of the city where I, I don't get that vibe in San Francisco. I feel like everyone's doing tech Everyone. in San Francisco. I, I mean, I, don't, don't get me wrong. We have an office out there. And I go out once a month, and I love it. Like, I love being there for, for four or five days, and I get to meet with all these folks. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, God, it's, it's all tech all the time. And, like, I you know I'm just so used to New York where, you know, you can kind of fade in the background a little bit. Um, do you feel like, I mean, like, a lot of entrepreneurs have said they move to Silicon Valley, particularly from L.A., because there is no distraction. Because there's this idea <laughs> that you need to spend every waking hour building your company if you're an entrepreneur. And that is sort of all there is. And everyone around you is also building or working for a company. Yeah. And, you know, people like to say there's like no girls and all this stuff. So it's like there's <laughs> few distractions. Yeah, Whereas yeah. here, that's not the case. I mean, can you have too much work-life balance? Yeah. Well, it, it can be like a little bit of an echo chamber. You know, if all of your friends are all doing startup stuff and like everyone's seen every permutation of every possible idea there is for an app, like it's just, I don't know, I think it's, it's, I always find it more interesting just to, you know, to pitch things and have conversations with, and especially talk about technology 
and talk about ideas um, with people that aren't in the scene. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you're connecting with the, the, you know, the real people that are supposed to use this stuff, not the elite class of people that are actually building it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, I think it's easier to build stuff that we all want to use, you know, together. And it's harder to build that stuff that, you know, the masses want to use. Um, and I think the best way to figure that stuff out is like, you know, there's just, it seems like there's just more of the, the, the non-tech elite in, in, in New York to test and experiment with. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's go back to the Google experience. Okay, so, so you, you think you guys have just won the lottery. You're the first round draft pick. <laughs> um, you show up at the Google Plex on your first day. What, what happens? Well, we worked out of the Google New York, we worked out of the Google New York office. And uh, I'll tell you the story if you don't repeat it. Um, and I mean, I won't. The, first, the, first, yeah, no, the first day we showed up, we didn't, um, <laughs> I don't think they had a desk for us yet. And so Alex and I didn't have a place to sit. And remember, we came out of grad school, we were like saving pennies to buy you know, $2 pizza at NYU. And then suddenly, everything you can eat, everything you can drink. And so we were just like, you don't even have to pay for the sodas. And we drank <laughs> at, like six Snapples and two Cokes. And eventually, I was like, oh my god, I'm so sick. And I, we had to go lay down on one of the couches. And our boss came and found us. He's like, I've been looking all day, looking around for you guys all day. And we're like laying down. I was like, oh my god, we're so sick. We ate all the food. <laughs> we drank all the Snapples. And I, <laughs> I think they were just like, oh my god, you guys. Um, no, but like it took us, it, you know, it took us a little, uh, a little while to get up to speed there, right? Because <laughs> We were outside of that story and to get the snap out of our system. But it's, you know. It's like a kid trick or treating for the first time. Yes. Well, absolutely. We were. Like, they were like, look at all the snapples. Every flavor and then all you can eat MMs. Like, people used to joke about the Google 15. Like, that was, yeah. that was us after like two days, you know? <laughs> Um, <laughs> we still joke like when we send Foursquare like when Foursquare people go to Google it's like take a backpack and fill it with free M&M's and bring it back for us um, no but like it took us it took us a while to figure out how to how to how to you know work within Google like we were two kids at NYU that worked you know 15 hour days all at all weird hours like sometimes out of the lab sometimes out of a coffee shop and now there's you know there's a lot of structure and, um, you know, there's people that you report into and sometimes they're out west and we don't know how often we're supposed to go to San Francisco. And when we're there, we don't know who we're supposed to meet with. And it's, it's really confusing. And, you know, it's one of the things that we've, um, you know, we've learned how to do at Foursquare now. It's like, you, you know, onboarding new employees. And I think Google has gotten much, much better at this where, you know, the, the way to do acquisitions is that you basically have a, a sponsor mm -hmm. and the sponsor oversees the acquisition. And they're like, okay, I'm responsible for making sure that you guys for the first month go to all the right meetings, meet all the right people, know what you're supposed to do, know how to be productive, know how the culture works. And like, you know, if, if any of you guys work at, um, at tech companies that have done like some kind of onboarding, you guys have probably gone through this. And we just, we didn't have that. We were like the guys that f fell, like, kind of slipped between the cracks. I think mm -hmm. just because we were so small, just because we we're in New York, just because it was like a chaotic time for Google. So I always talk about it being like, the perfect storm of stuff that could have gone wrong for mm -hmm. us there is, I think, one of the reasons why it didn't really work out. Mm -hmm. But most acquisitions fail. I mean, you think you guys, what happened with oh, you really okay. was like a, it's, it's shots of Jaeger, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what happened with you? How much did you look at it and say, that was our naivete, that was Google versus shit, this just doesn't work being acquired as a startup well, and I'll never do it again. When we were there, we were, just, we were just mad because we didn't know what to do. And in hindsight, you know, I can appreciate, um, uh, well, and I appreciate it, that's the wrong word, but I, I mean, I understand what happened because, like, we have two offices now and it's only, you know, 150 people. It's a lot of people, but, like, it's not the 10,000 people that Google was at the time and keeping people in sync across two offices and having people report to a, a manager, it's, and that, that's hard to do. Like, it's hard to do at our size. It's really hard to do at their size. And we were just like, like we were like firecrackers coming out of NYU, just like all we want to do is do this. This is our shot. We're going to change the world. Millions of users, and it's just like it just didn't fit into their strategy at the time, and we had a hard time having our, our voice heard. Right. So uh -huh. I mean, I, I don't like. I, sent, I remember like as soon as the Foursquare stuff started taking off, I went to um, the Google the Google um, Zeitgeist conference, and I sat down with um, with Larry. I sat at uh, um, a dinner table, and he's like, "Tell me what happened to Dodgeball." And I went through kind of the whole story, and he's like, man, it's like, we're, you know, we're much better at it now, and sorry about that. And we kind of like, you know, without hugging, we kind of like hugged it out. And then like I ran into like the, the you know, the, the BD people that brought us in there. And, you know, you kind of just kind of bury it like, man, I'm, you know, I'm, you know uh, sorry we made so much noise about it being such a, uh, like, uh, you know, an awful experience and everything. And, you know, like you just, you have these conversations, and you start to understand why things like that happen. Right. And so, you know, the lesson for us, especially as we're getting around the size that, 
you know, we could go and acquire other companies. They're not going to acquire like a 50-person company, but, you know, two people, basically the same size of Dodgeball, or 10 people, or eight people, whatever. Like, we know how to have the conversation with those folks. Like, listen, I went through this before. I'll tell you exactly what we expect. And, like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't know how to do that unless we had already gone through it. And it's mm-hmm. cool to be on the other side of it and to have those conversations with folks, you know. So what was the nadir of your Google experience? I mean, was there a day where you were just like, I'm out of here. This is so awful. What have I done? Um, we, um, yeah, there was a, we were on a, a, a video chat and, um, you know, it was talking about like what projects are going to get resourced. And then, um, you know, I was, you know, one of the guys, one of like 40 people on the call and I was like, what about dodgeball? It's like dodgeball. What is dodgeball? Is that even on the list? And I was like, come on guys. <laughs> and then that, that was kind of the beginning of the end of it. But you know, it was just, it was just really hard to get your voice heard. All the, a lot of the decisions are made out West. And you're in you're in New York, and there's not like you, you have to have like a real champion working for you, um, or working or being part of our team. And we just like we just didn't know how to play the system then. You know, you, you just don't, you know, you didn't you didn't know how to um, kind of navigate what was going on. So, so when you were going through that, were you already thinking that you wanted to do over, that you wanted a second a- no. attempt to do this? No, I was like, that's our chance, and um, now I am a, you know, ex CEO. Actually, I would never call myself CEO of Dodgeball, but like. You know, hey, we had a we had a startup and we sold it to Google, which is a success, but it didn't work, so it's a failure. Like I chalked it up as a failure, mm-hmm. and you know the whole like first round draft pick stuff goes away. Actually, I was like really, I was like severely depressed for like not like clinically depressed, but like you know I was I had a really shitty year for like you know a little bit over a year. Like my buddies in New York, were like oh, don't worry about this, Dennis. You're gonna find another job and you're gonna find something else that you're psyched about. And you know you'll 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 pull yourself out of this. I I had, like I had a really hard time like trying to figure out the next thing because I didn't want to do the same thing over again, even though that was the thing I was most passionate about, like building software for cities. Because somewhere there's some unwritten rule that you're not allowed to do the same thing twice, right? I guess. And then what happened is, um, you know, uh, I remember reading the as I had a, my buddy's birthday party. I remember exactly where I was. My buddy's birthday party with Naveen. Mm-hmm. And then um, my buddy Rick Webb turns around and he shows me on his phone the email that says, it has a blog post from like Gizmodo that um, you know, Google is going to shut down Notepad and Dodgeball. And I was like, they're going to shut it down? Like, if they're going to shut it down, like, we got to build another one. Because that's the way that we all got to this party was by still using Dodgeball. And so that's when you know, Naveen and I were kind of screwing around on the side with like, different concepts and stuff. Not seriously, and then it was that day. It was that night at this party, and I was like, "Dude, this is it! Like tomorrow, like we gotta let's just work on this stuff and let's launch it at South by Southwest." And you know, it's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, let's do this!" And uh, that was it. That was when we that was when we got serious about it. And the next day, you were still serious about it. It wasn't the like, yeah. "Oh, this is the oh no." We were like, we were like, "Oh my god, <laughs> if they're gonna take it away from us, like we're gonna we're gonna build another one." Like that that gives you the license to do it again. And once I started working on that stuff again, I was like, "I love doing this." Like I I was just psyched about building it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, here's here's the other thing, and not to like shift into like product talk or something, but like I used to sit <clears throat> sit at my desk at Google, and um, you know, all the stuff was still in PHP, and um, you know, I had a MySQL interface to all the all the you know to all the check-ins, which I don't even know how many check-ins, like a couple hundred thousand at the time. I, I don't know, but I would basically run queries that would say, um, you know, uh, okay, show me all the places that um, my buddies check into. Show me all the places that people check into. In, in the Lower East Side on Saturday between 11 o'clock and 2 in the afternoon. And it would come back with the list. I'd be like, okay, now rank them by popularity. Okay, now um, highlight the ones that my friends have been to. Okay, now remove the ones that I've been to. And these are like six different SQL statements. Each one would take me, you know, take like 30 seconds to run because they're so inefficient. But basically that's like, here's a list of all the brunch places that you should go to that are popular with your friends that you haven't been to yet. And I'm like, this is ludicrous that I'm the only one in the world that has access to this tool. <laughs> and I was like, this is what we are trying to build. Mm-hmm. And you know, we, we, would, we would talk about that at Google, and I was like, when, when we just, we have to, we, someone has to build that, because mm-hmm. I think we're the only one that see how, how powerful that is. And so that was the thing that Naveen and I got serious about. It's like, man, I've seen what this data can do. We gotta build this thing that can build another data set, like the one that we had at Dodgeball, maybe bigger, right? Just so we, you know, so we can run those queries and we can let everyone else run those queries. Like I should, anytime I go to a new city, show me the places that my friends go to so I'm just not wandering around at the hotel looking for something to do. Mm-hmm. Show me the places that like all my friends go to for dinner that I haven't been to that are trending like across the whole city. We knew we could do that. We just knew we needed enough, like we needed to resurrect the data set. Because like when, when Dodgeball ended, that was it. Like the check-ins went away and like the database went away. 
And you know, we, you know, Harry, <clears throat> God bless him, eventually built some like export tools so you mm -hmm. can export your dodgeball profile and put it into your your Foursquare profile, which is off. I mean, it was up for like a week. Um, but you know, that was we knew we that that's that was the reason that we did it again because we knew there were ideas that we had in dodgeball, really good ideas that only we were seeing, and that like we had to find some way to get those out in the rest of the world. And you knew the world wanted this. I mean, there was no sense of. We sold this to Google. They're a genius company. They saw no value in this. Maybe there is no value in it. No, I didn't know the world wanted it. I was like, I want it, and I want my friends to have it. <laughs> like we, ne I never built it so that my buddies on the Lower East Side could use that tool. Like we just never built that into the Dodgeball website, and you couldn't build it into a mobile app because there was no such thing as a mobile app at that point. And so, like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if we had another year at Google, we would have find some way to build it into like a BlackBerry app or something, or, or put it on the website. <laughs> But it was like, I, want, I, I don't want to have to type six SQL statements to figure out the best place to go you know, for sushi in the West Village. Like, mm -hmm. It should be like a one-click thing. Mm -hmm. And so like, and it's funny, because people talk about, like, oh, the, the pivot of Foursquare. I'm like, there's no pivot from game mechanics to recommendation engine. Like, we built this thing to generate lots of check-in data so we could, do, we could do that thing on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, and like now, like, we have almost like 3 billion check-ins. And like 25 million users, like we can, we can do it. And we have like 12 data scientists that plug away all day at it. And the stuff we can do is nasty. And like the stuff, the stuff that those, the stuff that those guys do, like it's, I think it's cool that like a lot of people in this room uh, uh, probably use like the explore recommendation engine. And like, we're, you know, we're seeing, we, we redesigned the app so more people would see that stuff and more people would use it. And that's working great. Um, <clears throat> and so the stuff that we wanted to do at Dodgeball, you can now do in Foursquare. That's great. But now there's a whole other layer of stuff that we can mm -hmm. do that the same way I was kind of you know, typing away with MySQL at, at Google, there's 12 of these guys that are, much, that are a thousand times smarter than I'll ever be um, you know, sitting around doing their own versions of what we were doing, inventing this amazing stuff. I'm like, this is, this is going to be awesome because like, we have the data and we have the platform and we have people listening to what we're doing and watching what we're doing. And now it's just build it and put it in front of people. Mm -hmm. And that's like... That's the dream come true. Like that's what you. That's what we've been trying to do all this time. So you're you've only recently really gotten to the point that you were kind of working towards. Uh, yeah, I would say like in the last like six months or so. Like these, it's at the point now where the guys on the data team like they make changes to this the search rec the search algorithms the um the like the top picks algorithms like there's there's uh, like any any of the recommendations that we have this stuff changes on like a on like three times a week and it just gets pushed and every like every couple of days, it gets better. Mm -hmm. And they're just on their own schedule. It's like, just commit, commit, keep committing code, keep doing it. And, you know, I had <clears throat> a guy was in the office today and we were just kind of, sh you know, shooting the shit about Foursquare. And he's like, man, I, I was, I, I'm, I'm an explorer all the time now. It's awesome. And I'm like, that's it. Once you get in it, once you play with it, people, people see what we're trying to do and people can like kind of tease out what we're trying to do with the data. I think we could do it. We still have a, a lot of work to do to do a much better job with it. But I think a lot of people are starting to starting to get it, mm -hmm. right? It's not, you know, it's not, hey, Foursquare, oh, mares and point and badges, that's, oh, it's so cute, I don't use it anymore. It's like, no, 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 this is the best local search tool on the planet. It's the only local search tool that uh, that is not doing one size fits all. It's every one search results are different at every time of the day, every day of the week, depending on where you're standing and what you've done over the last, like, you know, six months or six years. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, I'm just psyched that we get to work on it. <laughs> So, what are you said? You're starting to do more stuff than you'd imagine. I mean, can you give us an example of like some sort of something crazy one of your data scientists has come up with? Um, yeah, something nasty, as <laughs> you say. <laughs> Where's Aaron? Our Aaron? No, our Aaron. Your Aaron? She's oh, she's, oh, she's all she's, the way back there. She yeah, can't, can, yeah, she can't get to the stage and muffle you before you. Someone, someone built. We have a hack day. <laughs> one of the guys built something. Um, it was based off authenticity. Right, so it's like people that have been to Argentina and have bat and have um, checked in a bunch. This is not an official Foursquare project. This is someone like, hey, I came in on the weekend and I hacked this together because I wanted it and I wanted to see how it worked. And it's not in the product yet, and you guys might not see it for a while. Um, but it's you know I have it in, in my version of the app because all the hacks run on my version. It's awesome. Um, it's like <laughs> it's like Foursquare and steroids, just rad. And it's like okay, if all the people that have ever been to um, Argentina have a lot of check-ins in the country of Argentina, what are the Argentinian places that they go to in New York? Like, mm. how do you rank authenticity based upon the travels that other people have had? That's cool. People that have gone to tapas, tapas restaurants in Spain, what are the ones that they go to? What is just the one that they go to in New York? 
right? Because that's probably the one that's best. And then find 10 people that have had that same type of authentic experience and, and rank the results that way. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that is something I would never have thought of. But this guy is like, hey, I just I want to run the query and find out. And that's what you end up like. It's just a different lens into a lot of the data. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the, um, the Radar product that we have. We launched it last October. And Radar is this idea of, you know, how do you build a version of Foursquare that you don't have to use? It's just in your pocket. You turn Radar on, and Radar listens to where you go. And it's like, oh, well, these are the things you need to pay attention to. Like, you know, on my walk over here, you know, as soon as I turn the corner on Allen, Radar perks up, and it's like, oh, there's an art gallery here that you saved to one of your list, you know, three weeks ago that you said you wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's, that's it. That's, that's how the future of this stuff is going to work. Like, just ambient awareness of all this interesting stuff going on around you. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's, it asks, it's asking a lot of users to be like, anytime you want to do anything, pull out your phone and ask it a question. Like, that's just not how the world is going to work, like, a year from now. Right. It's going to work. It's like, these phones are a bunch of sensors that are connected to the network, that's connected to the graph and the global information superhighway, and we're going to be able to use all the signals from the phone combined with all the signals on the web to figure out what things are interesting to you right now. That's right? interesting. And like it, it works. Like radar doesn't work as well as we want it to. Um, and you know, some of the data guys are working specifically on that. It's like get radar working the way we want it so we can launch it, you know, soon so we can get people in the room playing with it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like every every couple like every week or so we get a little bit closer to that. That's interesting because it reminds me a little bit of like the big vision that color painted when it came out of like, oh, the camera will bring in light and bring in things and be able to tell yeah. you where you are and all this. But like, you know, here you guys just kind of did it or are doing it. Yeah, it's just go out and do it. You know, like the first, ver <laughs> first version of, um, of radar was based around like check-in reminders. And like, have any of you guys ever turned on radar or used it? Right? A couple people. Yeah, I mean, it drains your battery pretty. Like, the, the, there's always a problem with battery life with phones. And the, I'll tell you, the iPhone 5 is a lot better than I thought it was going to be at, um, at, with battery life. And so, you know, I've got my radar and my super version of Foursquare turned all the way up to be very, very aggressive. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm having kind of a cool time with it. But, like, you know, you go into a Starbucks and you sit in the Starbucks for five minutes and then Foursquare buzzes. It's like, oh, you're at that Starbucks again. Do you want to check in? I'm like, Yes, I do. Thank you, Foursquare. You're kind of smart. <laughs> you know, you walk into the sandwich shop that you haven't been to before, and it's like, oh, uh, Alex left a tip here two days ago um, about this sandwich. You know, do you want to see it? I'm like, you bet I would like to see that. And it's like, you know, it's like having your, having your little Foursquare buddy in your pocket that tells you about the place you just walked into, in the place that's around the corner, mm -hmm. in the city you just landed in. Like, that's what we've been, you know, that, that's what we wanted to build back at NYU. Right. And it's like, it was impossible. Like, there was no way to do any of that stuff. And now we got 150 people, all the data, we've got the people that can go through it, we've got the devices that are smart enough, and we've got, I get to sit on stage and talk about this stuff because like we're the only ones that are doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's, that's like the most exciting thing in the world. Because um, this is what we, you know, it sounds corny, this is what we dreamed about doing all that time, you know, mm -hmm. and NYU and everything. Now, I think the thing that's tricky about Foursquare, at least for someone like me and a lot of my friends, I mean, my friends tended to fall into two buckets. They were either people who were just the super early adopters of Foursquare and loved it, and my Twitter feed was full of them checking in everywhere they went, yeah. and like girlfriends were following boyfriends around places, and there were all these like Foursquare politics going on yeah, everywhere, yeah, yeah. and like, you know, we're just like rabid about it. And I remember we have a big annual party at our house, and it was like people were mayors of our house, we yeah, didn't yeah. know. And, um, and, you know, I never was a big Foursquare user because I don't want people to know where I am yeah. because they'll come and pitch me and mm -hmm. I don't always want to be pitched. And so to me, <laughs> like giving up my location, like a badge wasn't enough to get me there. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously it was for a lot of other people and that's created 3 billion check-ins, which has powered all this cool stuff you're yeah. doing. But then how do you get all the people who kind of were turned off by the privacy, but, you know, this stuff is kind of the cool stuff that yeah. would be worth giving up the privacy. How do you get them sort of where all those other people are? And do people need to all be active check-iners to get the value out of the new stuff? Yeah, this is like, this is kind of the, the big switch from, um, from last year to this year. And this is why we ended up doing kind of that little redesign of the app, is we started to see this cohort of users, <clears throat> it's like back in January or so, and there was a lot of people that were signing up. I don't know where they came from, like if, where they heard about it or whatever. But they were signing up and they, they weren't checking in. They were, they were just in the app and doing other stuff in the app. And, you know, we looked at it and it's like, is something broken? Like, did we push, push a broken version or, uh, to these new users? And then you look into it and it's like, no, they're just, they don't want to check in. They just want to use the recommendations. They just want to use the tips at a place. And I think, you know, it's a little bit of, like, I don't remember how many check-ins we had at the time. 
but I think it was probably around like two and a half billion check-ins, maybe somewhere between two and two and a half, that there's just enough stuff mm -hmm. in the, there's enough data and there's enough content that you can just, you know, you can download the app and sign up. You don't have to have friends on it. You don't have to check in anywhere. It's just, it's still smart enough to tell you where to go. Like there's a whole bunch of Amex specials that give you discounts. You know, there's a whole bunch of tips that tell you what to order at a certain restaurant. And, um, you know, Twitter went through this, this little transformation. Like for a long time, if you go back and look at like the archives on the internet, you know, it was all about how many people are tweeting, who's tweeting, like how many tweets are created. And then, you know, suddenly the story switches and it's like, it's not about the people tweeting, it's about the people that are consuming the content that the tweeters create, the Twitterers, mm -hmm. the tweeters. And, um, and we're in the same thing, you know, like we're kind of going through that same transformation now. Like, yeah, there's still a ton of people checking in. We get millions of check-ins every day. There's also a lot of people that are just kind of lurking on the site take, on, on, or in the app, taking advantage of all the other content those people are creating, mm -hmm. right? And so that's, that's um, you know, one of the things that we identify. It's like, all right, how do we change the app so that people can take advantage of that, so people can get to explore easier, mm -hmm. so we can see those recommendations um, even without having to check in places. And do you think you're there now? I think we're starting to get there. I think um, you know the app definitely got a lot easier to use when it went from five tabs down to three. And now we think about like, all right, well, what's next? Like, do we end up merging some of that? Do we make it simpler? You know, like, I think that's a, a like we don't need we have we have a ton of a ton of ideas at Foursquare. We have whiteboards full of things features that we could build. Like that is not our problem. Our problem is like simplifying. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you download the app and after you spend 15 seconds with it, after the brand new user from Dallas downloads it, like how do we make sure that they know exactly what they're supposed to use this for? When are they when are they supposed to pull it out of their pocket? Why are they supposed to share? How often are they supposed to go into explore? Like people people like as we get to the, the muggles, like the normal people in the world <laughs> using our stuff, like we don't do a good job at explaining that. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the big opportunity to fix for us, you know? And I wonder how much that's a marketing challenge because you guys, again, going back to the hype of the yeah. press, you got so much attention for check-ins and badges and gamification. You know, I mean, every time I talk to someone, you know, I've, I've talked, I, I know enough about you guys to know that, you know, there is kind of this other side to it and yep. you don't have to be this active user. But, you know, I talk to a lot of people who are muggles who feel like, oh, Foursquare, that was a thing cool tech people did three years ago. I mean, yeah. was there so much press that that's a hurdle I, I now? Don't, I don't think so. I'll tell you that we're, it, it's so funny how it always comes up because the, the, it's the same thing for Facebook, right? How many people here said, and you probably won't raise your hand, I'll never get a Facebook account. That is for college kids, and I am a grown up. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, probably okay, everyone in this room, unless yeah. they were in Yeah. And how many people or... were like, oh, Twitter? That's nerds talking about sandwiches. You know, <laughs> no, one, no one's going to use that. That's fine. Like, that, like, the press, God bless you guys, puts, uh, puts <laughs> successful tech companies through a hazing period. Right. In which it's like, oh, yeah, no one, Facebook, never going anywhere, you know? <laughs> oh, they hit their 50 million users. Like, that's it, you know? Oh, same thing with Twitter. And it's like, it's us. Like, you go back to like the TechCrunch comments and we hit a million users. And people are like, a million users, this is a fad, smell you later, Foursquare. And then three years later, you know, we hit 25 million, it's like, oh, same thing. People still talking trash in the comments. It's a, it's just, you, like- I mean, part of that is just the TechCrunch comments. I just- I, yeah, yeah, I know, but it's like, but this is, this is what tech companies go through, right? For and sure. this is why like when, and this is like a, uh, like a lesson we had to learn. It's like, you just kind of put your head down and ignore what the haters are saying and you're like, Listen, I've seen the MySQL statements. I see what the data can do. And when I show it to the people that write those nasty comments, I'm like, your mind's going to be blown and you're going to be singing a different song. It just might take us like another six months or eight months or 10 months to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's like, it's just part of it. And now we just, we understand how that works. Like, you know, I remember when we were, were a million users and we look at those comments like, oh my gosh, these people hate us. Maybe it is. It's a fad. It's not going anywhere. And then like, you know, you just get beat up so much by it that you just learn to ignore it. Like we know what we're doing. We can see the value. We see how like hyped up like Amex gets about this stuff. We can see what we're building on the roadmap. We can see the, like, the, the numbers around some of the stuff we're doing with, with, with Explore and some of the, um, um, you know, the promotion stuff that we're working on. Like, we can see that it's going to work. It's mm -hmm. just... It's, it's changing people's perception of what we're doing. Just like, you know, Facebook is not for college people, college, just for college kids. And just like, you know, Twitter is not for nerds and sandwiches. You know, Foursquare is more than points and badges and games. Like we're building, you know, the best ever local search tool all powered off this big data system on check-ins. Mm -hmm. And it just takes people a while to get there. But Facebook and Twitter both got huge and had, like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, had just massive pop culture resonance. I mean, yeah. every TV show has a Twitter hashtag on it. You know, presidential debates are on YouTube. I mean, you know, this massive cultural relevance. And 
you know, that was what crossing the chasm out of the nerds was. Yeah. So I'm curious with Foursquare, do you have to get that big to be successful? And is that your goal that there's four square check-ins on no, every beer commercial? Or yeah, it's, it's funny because people compare compare the numbers like, oh, we haven't you haven't hit uh, you know the Facebook scale where they were at this at this time or Twitter scale, and it's like, well, it's a different product. You know, there are lots of social. There's a lot of social. Um, Social tools built into built into Foursquare. Like check-ins, totally social. People are pushing into all these different networks. But like it's a it's a utility. It's meant to help your everyday be a little bit better. It's it's you know it's not the the time wasting app that you read on the bus and that you read while you're waiting for the ATM or the elevator. You know everyone has those apps. Um, you know like it's the thing that that tells you what to do and you may only use it a couple times a week and that's like we're fine with that. So like I don't think that we. Like we don't follow the same growth curves as those guys, and I think it's okay, you know, if if like we're not on that 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 same path, because like the core usage of the app is different, and the environment in which you would use it is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, like we're still trying to feel out how big does the audience need to be in order for us to be, you know, to, to be a successful company, especially at the at the size, 150 people going on 160, 175, 200. Um, and like that's something we, we still get to feel out and depends on how well a lot of our monetization and, and, and um, uh, you know, the promoted pilot that we're doing, it depends on a lot of, uh, on how well that stuff ends up performing. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's, not, it's not like if we don't hit a billion users, we don't make it. It's not if we don't hit 500 million users. Like it's, I mean, it could be, it could be you know, 50 million active users, it could be uh, 100 million, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's different, it's like, this is local search, this is not just you know, social on mobile or social on desktop. Right, well, and let's talk about the challenges of local because you know, it's long been one of the areas that Yahoo went after, AOL went after, Google went after, it was, you know, when I was sort of young and writing for, about tech for Business Week, everyone was obsessed with local. And then, you know, we saw Yelp and, you know, Groupon and Yelp sort of being, Yelp and Craigslist kind of being that slow burn and then Groupon yeah, yeah. just coming out of the gate blazing and then, you know, doing horribly. Um, I mean, local is one of the hardest things that you can just block and tackle, execute on the web because it's not about one network effect. It's about lots and lots and lots and lots of network effects. Yeah. So I'm curious, watching watching those guys and everyone struggle in this, you know, where you guys have maybe fallen into the same traps, um, traps you've avoided, how you paced it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't we don't have a sales team yet, right? And so that's one of the things that enables us to pace it, like. We're at 150 people, and it's you know it's a lot of product and engineering, and like as you know we're starting to round out the company with with all the other folks that we need to keep it running. But like you know our sales team is relatively small because we're still starting to experiment with this. You know it's it's always funny you look at um, you know the company the companies with a lot of people. There's usually a big sales force behind them: Groupon, Google, yeah. Yelp. You know, and you know are are we going to get there? Are we going to need to scale up our sales organization to you know 50, 100 people? Like I don't know. Like well, you know ask me that next year, and I'll have a better answer for you. Um, but I mean that—that's how that stuff grows very quickly. Was mm-hmm. that the answer? What was the, I can't remember I mean, the question. Well, I think it's—I mean, I think it's an answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, but it, it brings up another issue of you know why have you waited so long to have salespeople? I mean, you used to share an office with Curbed and Lockhart's on yeah, our yeah. board, and um, oh, that's he, cool, right. he told it was Lockhart's <laughs> birthday party that. Um, the oh, dodgeball really? news broke. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah, so we're, we're a little least, family here. Yeah. Um, Sorry for the moment. We just <laughs> um, so he told me that when you guys were sharing offices, I mean, people would call and like they would call Curbed and just be like, "Do you know someone at Foursquare we can give money to?" I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. it was such a hot story that it's like, why not pick up the phone and take money from people? Well, why we, wait this long? To it's because you know, like we knew what we wanted to build, right? It's like we we wanted to build tools for merchants that could show that. We could recommend, hey, hey, user, you should go to this place, and that the user would eventually go to that place, and we would be able to track it based off of like you know a check in or a credit card swipe or something. And we just now have the tools to do that. Like it takes a while to build a lot of that stuff, to build the recommendation engine, to get the user base there, you know, to to build the merchant dashboards, to get merchants using the product. Um, and you know, it's just you can't. We, we didn't. There was no reason to do it in two thousand nine. Like there, we had nothing to sell. Mm-hmm. And also, once you start taking money from people. Then you got to support them. Like there needs to be an account person there to call or to you know to take their money or refund it or whatever. I mean that that's that just requires an incredible incredible amount of infrastructure of the company. And like we're just building that out now. Like we have a you know a VP of finance now. We have um, you know people that can uh, can take these types of orders. We have some account people, some sales people. Like you know now is the appropriate time to do it because the product's ready. Mm-hmm. I think we could have raced into it, but I, I don't see how that would have ended well for us. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Um, so I know that you guys are just figuring out the monetization stuff now, but to me, the one reason Foursquare is going to be so exciting to watch for the next couple of years is I think someone has to be the test case um, for you can build a big business making a lot of money off each user in one yeah. way or another, not just amassing more and more and more users and you know showing them sort of like dumb banner ads. I mean, yeah. the fact that a week or so ago, um, everyone was saying, well, how does Facebook get to its next billion users? It's like the problem with Facebook is not that they need another billion users. The problem is they need a better way to monetize the billion sure. users they have. Yeah. Um, and I think you guys are such an inter interesting test case because you know, what you know about people because of that feedback loop. So, I mean, how valuable could each user get and how are you thinking about that? Well, I mean, when you look at this stuff, you kind of model out like revenue per user numbers and without going into a lot of the detail, like we try to, um, you know, we, we've, we've modeled out like where Foursquare is supposed to be at the end of this year, next year, and at the end of 2014 going into 2015. And so we make a lot of assumptions about, excuse me, what will merchants pay for the services? How many merchants will be able to pay for it? How many, how many will want to pay for it? Um, you know, will it be recurring billing? Um, you know, how many, how many users will be making export queries? So like we're, we, we're modeling all of this stuff out and when we do it, it puts us kind of right in the middle of like where, um, where Facebook and, and Twitter land for some of this, like at, you know, revenue per user. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do, I do agree with you that like there is a, a really, um, there's a really good chance that if we end up doing what we're doing, uh, as well as we're doing it now, and we can scale up number of users, number of merchants, that, yeah, it could be, um, you know, potentially much more lucrative on a per-user basis in some of those places. And are you looking at New York as sort of the test case for this? Are you looking at it nationally? Well, How do you think about it? Yeah, have it? any of you guys seen the promoted stuff that happens to be within, uh, within Explore, like promoted results? Yeah, we're, we're doing a trial now. We have 20, you know, it's like 25 paying customers, which mm -hmm. is, you know, that's... It's not a lot, but it's in, in their national retailers, right? So we've done, um, you know, we're doing some stuff with, uh, with Best Buy and Old Navy and basically people that have, like, a large footprint. So we can see, like, how do people respond to the promoted results? Do they, do they see them? Do they go to those stores? Do they swipe their credit cards there? Um, you know, do people like them? Do they add value to the app? Do the, do the merchants like them? Like, does it allow them to be creative enough? Like the point now is not for us to be generating a ton of revenue. It's for us to learn how these tools are supposed to work, and then learn how the users respond to the um, respond to you know what we're experimenting with in terms of these these promotions. And it's like it's going it's going well so far, right? And so we, we like the way that's happening. You know, we have more than a million um, a million merchants have claimed their Foursquare place, right? So that's not the not, that's not a million places. There's what is it? There's 50 million places on Foursquare added by the community. Thank you guys very much. Um, and, you know, one million of those places have been claimed by merchants. That's a million coffee shops and bars and restaurants. And so that's like our addressable audience. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we build self-service tools that um, enable merchants to pay for the, what we're doing with promoted offers. You suddenly have, you know, um, you suddenly have this engine that is now available to those million merchants that are registered. Mm -hmm. And so if you start to kind of lay this thing out, it looks a lot like Google AdWords targeted just at local exclusively on mobile. You know, mm -hmm. that is kind of the summary of the monetization plan. And that is a huge opportunity mm -hmm. if we can get that just right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look at the stuff that I'm telling you about what the app can do and how excited we are and what the data can do for consumers. And, you know, you can see the stuff we can do on the merchant side. Like, we have a really good shot at making that happen. Tell us what you can do on the merchant side. Well, I mean, like, you've seen some of the stuff in the, in the, in the merchant dashboard already. Like, I don't know if anyone here has claimed a venue on, on Foursquare. But, you know, you can, you can see, you know, standard analytics, like, uh, who are the who are the folks that, that have checked in? Um, you know the mayor, the time of day people check in, the day of week, the ebb and flow. Are you up or down? But then you start to think about like how do you segment those those users? Like can you target specific deals at specific customers? Like this person comes here all the time. They are one of your best customers. Um, but some places to open up across the street, and you're worried about losing them. So you know you end up you, you target a specific. 20% uh, off promotion just to those users that have been really loyal, mm -hmm. right? You can also say, who are the people that used to check in here all the time and they don't come here anymore? I don't know where they went, but they went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Can we target specifically those users and try to win them back? And then you've got things like, all right, you know, I have a, a restaurant in Soho and there's a lot of people in Soho, a lot of people that are in the neighborhood at all, all hours of the day. How do I make sure that those people that have never been to my place but spend a lot of time in this neighborhood know about my place and come by and check it out? Mm -hmm. And like that's the type of segmentation that we that we can do. Right. And so you know you look at what um like say Groupon was doing before with like a lot of the daily deals and just you know not being super targeted. Or I want to say Groupon, just like daily deals in general, mm -hmm. not being super targeted. Businesses complaining about 
Um, you know, is it bringing in the right, the, the right type of customers? These people that would have come here anyway. Like, we have a lot of that data. We can show a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And we can start segmenting this out based, on, based upon a lot right. of our merchant analytics. That and making. you avoid this thing that Groupon people hate about, like, just, like, the aggro coupon bargain hunters coming in and, yeah. like and then, doing what they can to get the most out of a deal. Well, there's, there's, there's that, right? And then also, has any of you guys ever done the Amex thing? Right? So, yeah, the Amex thing is rad, right? Awesome. And you know why it's awesome? Because I don't have to give the coupon to the person at the end of the date. Yeah. I just swipe my card and no one knows I got a discount on it, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's no, like, it's not awkward. It's not embarrassing. It's like just <laughs> happens between me and Foursquare and the infrastructure that's going on in the background. And, like, that's, that's awesome. Like, that's, that's the, the redemption has always been a huge problem. And, like, you know, no one talks about how we've kind of fixed that. But, like, that's, that's great. Like, we solved, we solved that problem. Mm -hmm. Do you think timing-wise you guys hit the market exactly right this time. I mean, it was certainly very early in the app economy. It was more substantial than a lot of other things. But, you know, we're, you know it took a long time for iPhones to become mainstream enough. And how do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I think we, we timed it pretty well. I think, you know, the tough thing now, and you know, some of you guys in the room might know it, like it's tough to launch something new because there's like 10 things that launch every day and they're all pretty good and they're all kind of doing the same thing as something else. And like, I think if we were launching today, we'd have a much harder time. You know, we want, we were the only, you know, only ones that launched at South by Southwest 2009. Like we had the stage to ourselves. <laughs> um, and so that it's just not that, it's just not that way anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we, we, we had an advantage because like we had done this before. Like we, we weren't like, we have this idea. I wonder if it's going to work. I mean, like I had written those SQL queries a whole bunch of time. It's like, just build something that gets enough of those check-in data so we can start making those crazy queries mm -hmm. and then just keep executing on that. Like we knew how the privacy model would work. We knew how the tip stuff would work. We knew, you know, that, you know, when someone's checked in, you only stay checked in for three hours. You got to give people tools so that they can block their ex-girlfriend so it's not awkward. Like we, we knew all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't learning on the fly. It was just, you know, build, 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 build. And now we're at the point where it's like, okay, now we can start doing some of the more experimental stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, th th some of the stuff where it's like, all right, we got we to gotta test this and see how it works. So is this more fun? Was that more tedious? Uh, no, it's all, it's all fun. Like when you have something that takes off like, like you know, Foursquare did in 2009, like there's, that's super fun. I mean, it's, it's kind of awful at the same time. It's like your classic good problems to have. Like imagine if we had a million users and then it's like, oh my God, we have a million users. Like everything's <laughs> melting all the time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's fun and it's not fun. Just like, you know, every day now, like for you guys that are doing startups yeah. here, like, you know, I know there's like a, some reality TV show about people doing startups, right? They're not really doing startups. Oh, is it like the Hills? It's like, the, come on. They're, well, yeah, it's scripted. Oh. I mean, they're, li they're living in a $17,000 a month villa in the oh. Castro. What entrepreneur does that? Uh, I, I, there's, <laughs> part of the activities are, uh, female founder yoga. All right. So it is, it's like, it's like the Hills for startups. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. I didn't know that. Oh, anyway, because I mean, like, so many people, like at Thanksgiving, you know, I'll go home and my family's like, you're on your own company. It's so much fun. You must be having the time of your life. And I'm like, it's crazy. Like, it's, it's very hard. Like, you know, yeah. nine, 9 to 10 is good. 10 to 11 a.m. is a disaster. You know, lunchtime, maybe it's good. You know, it's like every day is a roller coaster. It's not like, oh, your life is a roller coaster. It's like every day, 9, 10, yeah. 11, 12, 1, 2. And it's every day is like that. I have that. to say, that's the question that has pissed me off the most since starting a company is yeah. people saying, are you having fun? I'm like, yeah. no, I'm yeah. not having fun. Yeah. Are yeah. you kidding? I, like, the highs, you wouldn't even describe as fun. They're, like, crazy. Yeah. But then, like, I mean, like, this was the first, like, New York has been a really hard market for us to do events. I mean, our San yeah. Francisco, the first one sold out, and we sold, you know, $70,000 memberships the first one. Like, the LA one sold out. Like, New York has been hard for us. And this is the first New York event that sold out in, like, a day. Yeah. And it was like, oh, and, like, that's more than fun. That's, like, Finally, like we've done five in this market, like and they're working, starting yeah. to, you know what I mean? And you're starting to see it. So it's like the high is way more than fun. Yeah. But then like the, everything else is awful. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's not fun well, at yeah. all. I mean, this is, this is fun for me. This is like, <laughs> this is dessert on my day. Right. And cause I like this, I like talking to people and I like telling the story and I like telling people like it's hard and impossible and you think it's going to fall apart every single day. Um, yeah. you know, and, and you know, but like, yeah, I have, Today was a good day where I had um, I had like four product meetings and out of every single one we're like oh my gosh we're absolutely gonna crush this yeah and you know but then like two nights ago like you're like oh you can't sleep because something's not working the way you want it to and you gotta go and fix it and you don't know how to do it and you know you know that's just that's just the way it is you just gotta get used to it are you one of those guys who really likes those early days or do you like when no. you get big enough because like I never want to do that <laughs> I'm like I'm with you I, I there are people in the valley who are like I just like the first six I like. Fuck that. I never want to yeah. do the first six months again. Like, I like that oh, we're getting early dominant. early days of the company. I, yeah. 
uh, it's fun when you get to move very quickly, right? Like I've, I've, I feel like in dodgeball and early days of Foursquare, we move very quickly. And now, like you know, we we move really quick for a startup of our size. And it's funny because you know there'll be guys like I, mean, I was in a design review today, and I was like, oh no, no, this is this, and he's like, we did this, and we made something from scratch in a week. Like this is just we're we're doing just fine here, <laughs> um, you know. But like, yeah, you you want to get things done every single day. Mm-hmm. And so like one of the big lessons for me, you know, as the company grows, is like. The way that things get done is for me to like, you know, put my hands in my pocket, like not to have my hands in what everyone else is doing, mm-hmm. like to, you know, to listen and to be in all the meetings and make sure that like, you know, that everyone's on the same page and people know what they're doing and people know why they're doing it and people understand what's good and what's not good, but not to be like up in everyone's business all the time. And the better I get at that, like the faster and more efficiently everything else works. Mm-hmm. That's a really hard lesson to learn. Like how do you remove yourself in the process so the process can run more efficiently? You know what I recommend? Having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, in, in April, it all has to be working without yeah. me. Oh, there, there you go. Yeah, you're in a deadline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You should have a little countdown <laughs> clock in your office. I, I have in my you know? head. Yeah. Okay. There you go. It's like 800 <laughs> hours to figure this out. <laughs> oh. Um, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit more about sort of this sort of art of being a CEO because I know it's something that you've taken you know seriously, and a lot of product-based founders don't. Um, mm-hmm. You know. Uh, one of your investors has been Horowitz, who's you know one of the big sort of CEO whispers of Silicon Valley, <laughs> and um, you and I were both in Dick Costolo's CEO school. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, which for people who don't know, Dick Costolo, you know, he inherited sort of this mess at Twitter, where it had gone through three CEOs. There were all kinds of different people brought in at different times, different cultures. There was like no standard. So he decided he wanted to write a course for how to manage at Twitter, and he had. Ben and some other people help him write it, and he gave it to all of his managers at Twitter, and other people found out about it, and really, I think you were actually one of the first who really wanted to do it, yeah, yeah. and so he taught it for first-time entrepreneurs in the Valley, so like David Karp and you yeah. and me, and like all these people came in awesome. on a Saturday yeah. and did this course. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about either what you've gotten out of that, what you've gotten from Ben. You know, I feel like people glamorize the young startup founder who doesn't know what he's doing, but yeah. how much did you... How much is there that's good about learning how to do this? Um, well, I mean, it's like it's cool that you get to learn it all. You know, Harry and I always joke. It's like, man, at the end of this thing, we might be so burned out that like it feels like a disservice not to do it again because you've learned so much. But it's like, I, mean, I don't know if I have the energy to do this again because it's like really taxing. Um, and I, I'm not convinced it's going to be any any easier if we ended up do you know ended up ha- you know doing it again somewhere else or whatnot. Um, you know, like. I think Andreessen Horowitz has that, their, their investment philosophy is based off, off of like, you know, we want to turn um, founders into CEOs. Like the goal is not to replace the CEO with a professional CEO, it's to grow them. And it's mm-hmm. easier and more successful to grow them than it is to replace them. And so, you know, those guys are great. They spend a lot of time with us teaching us what we're supposed to do, what to pay attention to, how to manage time. And it's like, you know, there's no there's no school that teaches you how to do. I mean, I've never taken business courses. I don't know if people have been to business school here, but the people that I know that have been to B school, like, there's no. This is how you're a CEO, right? right. Course, like, you know, one of the things that's helpful for me is every time I go to San Francisco, a bunch of tech CEOs we get together for dinner and we talk about like, you know, what's working and what's not. What are you struggling with? What's working? Like, what's helping you, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we figured out some things like keep my hands in my pocket, like over communicate all the time, how to do company meetings, you know, what to, what to get stressed about, what not to stress, stress about. There's other folks that take more of an operational role. Um, and you know, they can advise us on like, okay, well, like what do you do about, about grants and strike price and, and training and laddering and, and like mm-hmm. just all the stuff that it just, there's no other way to learn it, but by doing it. Mm-hmm. And like, I feel really fortunate that, I mean, I have a really strong COO, um, you know, a guy I used to work with at Jupiter way back in the day, Evan Cohen. And, you know, he, he helps a lot. Like, he's basically my, my Sheryl Sandberg. Like, he, like, is, is you know, very, um, um, very effective at, at, at running parts of the organization that, like, I don't, you know, I don't have to worry about because I get to spend so much time on, on, on product and, like, that team and just, like, you know, building, building the stuff that we build every day. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. And, you know, I think, I don't know if the best way to learn is by going through it, but I don't, that's the only way I'm learning it. Right. One of my um, board members always says that um, being a CEO is like standing in a really dirty room and you only have like one mop and one bucket and like you're never going to clean up the whole room. But yeah. like they basically grade you on if you clean up the right things. Yeah. Um, and a similar analogy was like Peter Thiel first told Mark Zuckerberg when they invested like, you know, every you're going to fuck stuff up and you're going to fuck stuff up all day long. But like, don't make sure you don't fuck up the wrong, you know, the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, like, tell us about some of your mistakes 
And, and, or, you know, or maybe what are some of the things that you, that were the, like, maybe you fucked up everything else, but like, this was the thing you got right. That was crucial that you got right. Um, crucial that we got right. Well, like we put really good people in place of, um, running key parts of the organization. Like, I feel like I got lucky in a lot of ways. Like Harry, Harry Heyman, who I used to, I worked with at Google and is, um, like he's our, you know, he's like our, our lead engineer. He manages the engineering team. It's a huge team. And he, he hadn't done that before. And he grew into that role. Like we didn't, we didn't have to replace him. Like there was a moment where, you know, it's like, are you up for this? And he's like, yeah, I'm up for this. I can do this. And like, he's grown into it perfectly. Mm -hmm. You know, Alex, who I worked on with Dodgeball is like, is running the product team and he's managed people before, but not at this scale. And he's doing, he's doing really well with it. Like we've got a great, um, you know, CRO, Steven, that we did, we picked up um, earlier this year. And he's an, you know, he's an executive. He was at Apple for a while and he brings a lot to like, our executive, um, our, our executive meetings, right? Like, when it's like, Hey, I've been in these meetings before. This isn't how they go. You know, he's like having like a little mini Ben Horowitz that guides us in a lot of this, a lot of the stuff. Cause he's been like an executive at another company. You know, Evan's been fantastic. Like, I feel like I got lucky in a lot of ways. Right. Um, where I have like a, a great team. Um, you know, things that we've, we've screwed up on, like, it's um it's communicating right i think this is the biggest thing and i'm still learning how to do this effectively but like i i cannot have things in my head about the company the product the business anything um that that aren't written down somewhere that people don't know about because it like i'm not going to do them like I, you know i'm not like an individual contributor at the company like my goal is to get all the stuff that I think about all the stuff that it comes up at meetings that no one captures and make sure it gets spread throughout the company. Make sure everyone knows why we're doing, why we're doing it. And I think, you know, for, for a while, um, you know, I, I don't think we, we were doing that effectively. You just assume like, oh, people came to Foursquare and they know what we're doing. They know why we're working mm -hmm. on this stuff. And then you turn around and you've got like 150 people and, you know, six people started last week and seven people started the week before. And then there was five people the week before that. And you're like, they don't know anything about, about what we're, what we're doing or like where the company came from. Like I gave a, um, I gave a, a talk at the, we had a company meeting, we did it every Tuesday, and I gave like an hour and 15 minute talk about like, this is, this is where Dodgeball came from. This is how we ended up at Google. This is what early prototypes look like. This is why we built it this way. This is why the screenshots look like this. This is why this thing in the app is still broken. Mm -hmm. And walk people through the whole story of the company because it's important for me that people understand like, this is, this is how the app got to be this way. This is why these things are important and these things aren't. This is why we're thinking about things this way. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the hard things for me, because I've been doing this, like, we're almost on four years, or three and a half years, four years, with Foursquare, and, you know, I was doing Google for two years, and then Dodgeball for a couple years before that, like, mm -hmm. I've, I've heard myself tell the story a thousand times, and I'm sometimes sick of hearing myself tell it, but that is my job at Foursquare, is to tell that story every single day to every single employee, so they, they know what we're doing, and they know why we're doing it, mm -hmm. and that's the whole, like, over-communicating thing. Once you get over the fact that, oh, man, I'm so sick of hearing myself talk about this, but that's, that's what I got to do, right. and that, that's, proved, that's proven to, be, um, to work okay for us. Let's talk about the fundraising side of things because, you know, back in the days when you guys were getting incredibly hyped, um, there was also all this news that, you know, people were making big acquisition offers. Mm -hmm. You were rather boldly turning down. The acquisition offers were competing with bigger and bigger valuations. You know, you wound up raising money at a pretty large valuation. Mm -hmm. I mean, how frenzied was that time inside the company? Because it looked frenzied from the outside. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, like we didn't know how to do the Series A, and I think we did an okay job with that. And then it came to the Series B, where everyone was super focused and Foursquare and super excited about it. And we just, we didn't know how to handle that. You Did know? you get forced into the Series B? Were people sending you unsolicited term sheets? Or was it? Well, I would say it... We, we didn't get forced into it. We knew that, okay, this is the right time to do this. Okay. Um, but yeah, like, you know, when, when, I mean, there was a lot of blog coverage at the time, like, Foursquare is going to sell to this company or this company or this company wants to get in and they, they might choose these guys. Like, we, we didn't know how to, like, um, now, now we know how to do this. Like, it's called running a process, right? And you run a process <laughs> and there's like, there's a start date and there's an end date. Dear venture capitalist, we would, we're doing a Series B, and we're going to come out, and we're going to meet with people this week. This is the week we're going to start, and then we're going to meet with people the next week, and there's a week to answer questions. And then the last week, this is the end date, and then you're going to give us your term sheets, and then we're going to decide. And when you explain the process to people, it works. And we did that in our Series C, and it worked very well. Mm -hmm. The Series B didn't have any process. And it was like the Wild West where people were showing up at the office to give us term sheets and chasing us down the street at South by Southwest <laughs> to give us term sheets. And, you know, it was a different rumor every single day. And we just, we didn't do it very well. We didn't manage that very well. And so we've learned how to do that now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I forgot your original question. Well, it was pro probably more interesting than the question. Um, I mean, how did you navigate through that? Like, Oh, well, you was just, it... you, yeah, you, you learn from other people. Like you go to those same CEO dinners. It's like, man, you just raised around. How did you do it? 
Like, how did you put these two people against each other? How did you get the prices way? What, what do you think about these terms? Are these good terms? Are these not ter- good terms? Should I optimize for price or terms or investor or board members? You know, like it's it's helpful to be able to ask those questions right. to people that have done it before. Well, and what I mean, what are the answers? Because I feel like What's, every CEO would give you a, you know a different a different answer based on his experience. Do you optimize for valuation? Is a is a too high of a valuation a danger? Because then there's a risk in the future of a down round. Yeah, you know, it, it depends for. Um, uh, it, it depends. It's different for different stages. It's different for different companies. It's different for like you know your gro- your growth trajectory and like where where you end up seeing your monetization part uh, path mm-hmm. and like you know what chapter of the story are we are we now telling? Um, you know people. It's funny. Like um, I was uh, you know I was talking to Ben Horowitz the other day and like one of the one of the great things about um, the group of investors that we have is like they've seen the inside of lots of other companies. They've seen the inside of lots of different board meetings. And so it's not like I go to these guys and I'm like, here's my question. What is the answer? Because that's, that's just not how this works. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, here's the problem you're having. Let me tell you four examples of four different anonymous companies and how they solve the same problem. And then you can figure out what you think is the best solution for the problem that, that you face, for the, the situation that you're in. Mm-hmm. And that's how, that's how it goes. You know, it's like, let's find a company that's kind of around our, that, that was at our size at a certain time, around the same valuation, and let's talk to the people that were involved in that round and find out what, what worked for them and what didn't work for them, you know? So in hindsight, did you focus too much on valuation in the Series B? Did you I, I don't think so. I think, I think we played our cards pretty well, um, you know, all, through all three rounds. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't really have any... Any regrets about that at all? Mm-hmm. You don't worry about. Did you get too far ahead of your skis at any point in terms of price? No, I mean, it's you know, it's it's hard to tell unless like you're living in Excel all day long, right? Like I, I base my optimism for the company around our ability to execute on those MySQL statements. Mm-hmm. You know, I hate to keep going back to that example, but like I can see what we're doing, and I can you know because I've been doing this stuff for a long time, I feel like I have a good sense of like. We are building stuff that people will not be able to live without. And there's lots of people that live in cities and there's going to be more people living in cities and more people using phones and more people that know about location-based services and more merchants using this stuff. It's like, this is, I don't see how it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work out, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, we are in, we are in such a good position to take advantage of this. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can argue all day long. Like, the number's just right or the term's just right. But, you know, like, we've, we've, you know, to answer your question, like, we've optimized to make sure that we had, like, Amazing investors that had a lot of insight that were patient that brought into the that bought into the vision mm-hmm. and they understand it's like it's going to take us a while to get there and it's going to you know we're going to have to try a bunch of stuff to get there mm-hmm. and like I don't have any regrets about that like the, the board's not disruptive like we have a good relationship with these guys like we get we get a lot of value out of the board meetings and the one on ones we have with them so mm-hmm. like it it is working when um, when we interviewed uh, Ben Lehrer a couple panda monthlies ago. He said that the big shock when he was raising his round um, recently was that he had to get on a plane, and he still pretty much had to fly to Silicon Valley to get money. I mean, I know Fred yeah. Wilson's one of your investors, but um, are you surprised that there's not more of that in New York? Do you think that's a weakness? Um, you know, it's. I think a funny thing happened between our Series A and our Series B, where, um, and I, I don't want to say it's just a Foursquare thing because, like, you know, Etsy and Tumblr were kind of blowing up at the same time. But you know, a lot of um, a lot of firms ended up placing people in New York, right? There's like maybe one or two people in the office to make sure that they're sniffing around what's going on at the Ace Hotel, and what's going on at Tom and Jerry's, and what's going on at the New York Tech Meetup, and what's going on at things like this. And what people are talking about, so they don't miss those next deals. Mm-hmm. And like the, you know, that's that scene grew up a lot in that one year period. Um, and so, like, I mean, I. I when we when we did our series um, we did our series B like we had um, you know we know we knew we wanted to get someone from um, from the valley because we knew we were going to put an office out there and we knew we wanted some you know we wanted like a, a, a big brand name venture capitalist uh, venture capital firm so that's why like we went out west specifically looking for that and talking to a lot of those folks you know when it came time to do the uh, series C we did the same thing you know we, we we talked to firms on the east coast we talked to firms on the west coast and um, you know. I, I would, I would never say like, oh, you can just do it in New York. Like, it, it's it's definitely beneficial to talk to talk to everyone. But um, you know, like I've had a great experience with Union Square, and I know they've been very supportive of uh, you know, the, like they're super supportive of the New York tech scene. So, mm-hmm. like, it's 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 a good thing that I think there's a lot more uh, VCs here than there were you know even just three or four years ago. It's like that's that's the part of the ecosystem. You know, it's like us that are building the stuff. It's you know, entrepreneurs have gone through it before. It's you know. Um, you know, people that have had exits that now go on and start mentoring different startups. 
And it's a lot of Valley people here that are willing to take meetings with everyone to learn what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's how this starts. And every time someone in here gets to go and, um, you know, every time a new shop opens up, like that's, that's one more person that can take all of your meetings. And then that's e opportunities for everyone here to pitch those guys, mm -hmm. you know, like we did our A, we pitched, I don't know, 40 people, 35, 40 people. And the pitch was awful <laughs> the first 10 times. And then you get good at it. Like you're just practicing. And it's like, okay, you know, you practice and you work your way up. And then by that time, you've, you know, you've pitched 14 companies and then you get to sit down with the guys at Union Square. You know how to, how to, like, how to work that room. And like, that's like, you just get good at it. All right. So you, you've now referenced twice being awful at pitching VCs and you've obviously gotten better. So I want some, like, give some entrepreneurs in the room who've never raised money before or going through this. Like, what are the five things you do not do in a meeting with a VC? Um, five things you don't do. Gosh, I don't know. Um, I can tell. I can tell you things to do. I, I don't know. I, I, I wish I. You did things wrong. You I keep did all saying. sorts of things wrong. Yeah, I know. Um, we we were kind of unconventional about it. Like, you know, I would. Here's what I would do. I would. I would. Um, I used to sit in Barnes and Noble and read the business school books uh, on the floor. Like, this is how you make these Excel sheets, and this is what they're supposed to look like, and this is how you put together the ten slides. And I just it just didn't feel right for us, you know. So I'm like, I would just walk in and be like, all right. Here's like my deck was um my deck is like 160 slides and it's just photos it's photos of stuff see this is why I think this is interesting next step this is why I think this is interesting next step and it all leads into okay and this is what we're doing with Foursquare these are the opportunities that we can take advantage of there's no charts there's no there's no bar graphs there's no competitive matrix it's just like a story and we've always done this we did this even with the series C like we told like the story of the company how we got to where we were what what are the mistakes that we made what are we excited about what is the future going to be and we do it with pictures. And like that's that's worked for us. I wouldn't recommend everyone do that because like don't they, get 160 slides. Every VC watching this now is just like, what did he just yeah, advise I everyone mean, to do? I, 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 that's right. We we did we did that out in, uh, in the valley for the Series C, and I had one of the best, um, like most well known figures in the in the venture industry coming to me after, and he's like, that was one of the best presentations I've ever seen. And I was like, yes, all right. Thank, that was I was I tried to play super cool, and I was like. Oh, thank you very much, sir. You know, and I was like, that's that's awesome. That's like, you know, that's like Wade Boggs coming up to tell you, like, hey, great hit. Like, great. Wade Boggs is a Red Sox baseball player. Um, but, like, you know, no, like, whatever. But you, you get the point. No um, one here is interested in baseball. Everyone interested in baseball is home watching the playoffs. Yeah, I don't even know if I have Wade Boggs. It's like a 1986 <laughs> Red Sox mention. So. <laughs> Lockhart would love that. Yeah, he, he, Lockhart would totally get it. Um, but, no, I think I, here, here's the advice. It's like, do the thing that works for you. You know, um, I, I've sat down with a, a ton of people at coffee shops and they show me their deck. And I'm like, this is a template that you picked off of some website and it doesn't fit what you're, the story that you're trying to tell. So don't use the template. Just tell this, like, well, where am I going to put the slide? I'm like, put it at the end, the appendix. If someone asks for it, you can just show it, you know, and talk about the stuff that you're excited about. Talk about, like, the prototype that you built and why it either worked or why it didn't work and what you learned from it not working. And then what did you learn the next time that you launched it and what worked and what didn't work? Like tell the story of like of how you're growing it. Because I think that's, you know, I think like the one of the cliche, not the cliches, but you know, they say um a lot of these folks like they, they invest in teams and they invest in people, not just ideas. Like ideas are a dime a dozen. You have to be able to execute on it. And so if you can show them that like I'm growing and learning and this stuff is getting better um, because of all the mistakes that we've made, like, hey, it's like that's that's positive. Right? I think that's one of the things we want to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um did you notice a difference between the way VCs treated you in the early days and then when you were doing that Series B? I mean, did you see a lot of guys who were like kind of dicks before and like, you know, suddenly when you were Mr. Mr. New York? Well, we started we start in Series A. You know, I, I, I talked to 35 people before we got a yes. And then as soon as we got one yes, all everyone called back. And they're like, oh, remember... We wanted to get in. I'm like, yeah, you know, it wasn't super positive. So like, we 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 had that, and we've we've had it. A, we've seen that a couple of times with folks. Uh -huh. Um, and you know, it's it, it, whatever. It's like I don't blame them. You know, in the same way that like I can reminisce about how we were at NYU, and I know what a crappy pitch looks like because I've given a ton of them. Like the f early four score pitches are were, were bad. People are like, this is just like dodgeball. Why is it going to work? And I'm like. I don't know. I don't know what the merchant plan is yet, but I, I can tell you, I've told them the MySQL story. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, I know this is going to work. This is just what people are going to do. Like, just trust me, I get it. And um, like, that's not a good pitch, you know? <laughs> so, and, and now, but then, you know, over time. So there's one don't do. Well, well here, here, here's the thing. So you guys, I don't know if you guys know the story of the Series A, but, um, 
you know, the, mer the whole merchant platform on Foursquare, that wasn't like, that wasn't our idea originally. There was some, some, there's a cafe in San Francisco called the Marsh Cafe. And um, they hung flyers in the neighborhood with the old Foursquare logo with the, the girl bouncing the ball. And they said, check in here and you'll get, um, you get $2 off your, off a ticket to a show. Um, and, you know, someone called that to my attention. And I was like, oh, that, there's someone posted the picture on Flickr. And I, mean, I remember, I think the, the owner wrote out, you know, reached out to me and he's like, hope you don't mind, but I used your logo for these flyers. And I was like, this is, this is great. And then Charlie O'Donnell, who now has, a, he has his own uh, fund in Brooklyn, which I hear is doing pretty well, um, uh, he was working at Union Square Ventures at the time. He wrote a blog post about, I saw the future of Yelp, and it's called Foursquare. Mm -hmm. And it was about what we're doing. And it's like, these are the merchant tools. And there's user, like there's Foursquare users checking into places. And they're like, and this, this is what's going to happen. We wrote a really nice post about it, which got, and Fred either, I, I don't even know if people were retweeting at that time, but did something or reposted <laughs> it or retweeted it or something. Emailed it. And, and that was like, that was the signal that other people needed for like, okay, the Foursquare guys are legit. And that's when we, for us, I'm like, oh, that is, that's the part of the story that's missing. Those are the slides that aren't in the deck, mm -hmm. you know? And so I took that, the picture of the, of the, um, of the, of the flyer and I put it in the deck. And then every time we gave a, pre uh, a pitch, I talked about that slide for 10 minutes and I kind of like imagined what the future would be like. And people were like, all right, I get it. Merchants are going to pay you to drive um, customers into the store. I'm like, yeah, I think that's going to work. Like, you and, owe this guy so much. Well, I mean, he, have you he done anything started. nice for him? Yeah, Charlie's awesome. You know, no, not Charlie, the merchant. Who oh, the made merchant. The flyer. Yeah. Oh, well, Charlie wrote the post. <laughs> no, but that's it. Like that, it was, it was it was happening at a bunch of different places that we found out later, right? And then it's also like, remember Tristan Walker, the Stanford intern that like bullied his way into a job. Like you know, he saw that and he was able to tell the story. And it's like, it just things came together at the right at the right time at the right pace for us, and you know, enabled to see stuff that that we weren't able to see because we're so focused on product. Yeah. It was like, oh no, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll just figure it out. And then as soon as someone showed us like, okay, this is probably the way it's going to get figured out. It's like, oh yeah, we can build products around that. You know, we can make this work. I didn't know that story. I, I love it though, because to me, that's, that's what's so great about startups is there is always this thing that's out of your control that like tends yeah. to happen around ideas and like, you couldn't have controlled well, that I mean, happening at, or know what didn't if it didn't. Twitter didn't invent at replies. It didn't invent art retweets. People were just doing it. And Twitter's like, man, people are doing it. Let's just build it in as a feature. Mm -hmm. Same thing's happening on Foursquare. A lot of people checked in somewhere. Maybe give them a badge because it's a swarm. And then it's like that builds up. Then it's trending. Then it's swarming. And then it's like, you know, you, you kind of just go with the flow of what the users are doing. They'll show you the way. You know, the merchants are showing us every single day what they want to do with the app. And we just, we build around it. Mm -hmm. And the users show us what they want to do with it. And we, we build around it. Like, mm -hmm. you got to listen to the community. And then, you know, you kind of just, um, just take their guidance and run with it. So you talked about the frenzy around the Series B and, and how you learned from that. At the same time, reportedly, a lot of people were talking to you guys about buying. Now, given your experience, did you even consider that? I mean, on some level, like, people always say, oh, I would never consider selling. But, like... At some level, you have people working for you, you have co-founders you have to consider, Yeah, right? we were like 12, of course we considered it. It was 12 people, a lot of money. Um, and so we looked at it, and it's like this, is like, this is 10 times as awesome as we ever thought it would be. And this is like a year into it. And then, you know, you think back to, I, I'll tell you, I thought back to like that year that I had after leaving Google, and just how lousy it was, and just how I had a really hard time, because I had this thing I was so passionate about, and I wasn't working on it anymore. And I could just imagine all the ways it could go wrong if, if we were to do it this way. And like if we were to go, you know, bring it to a, um, a bigger company early, we said, no, like we'll, we'll keep working on it. And was everyone united on that? Did it take it, other people longer to get there? It, you know, it, it was a, a discussion, you know, not like a heated debate, but like we definitely talked about it. Like, should we do this? Should we not? Like, I don't think anyone in the company looks back like, oh man, we totally should have taken that, you know, we should have totally should have sold back in 2010. <laughs> um, because like people are bullish on what we're doing. Like it's, it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. You know, I, I, I sat down with my, um, with my dad around that time. We had to turn those offers down. And he's like, he's like, I don't know how you can turn that down. He was just like, I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I think we're, <laughs> like, we're going to turn down much, much bigger offers like later on. Like, I think that's going to be hard. And um, like, we, it was just like a little bit of a disconnect. And he's like, I trust you, man. Like, you're, I trust you to do this. But like, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't, you know, I might have looked back once or twice right after that, but like not now. I mean, mm -hmm. like we're, we've, we've, we've done the hard stuff. We have a 150 people working together at Foursquare to build the stuff that we were whiteboarding 10 years ago. 
like that's that's the dream come true stuff. It's it sounds corny, but like this is our shot to do it. And like yeah. very few companies make it to this stage. And um, it's it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So you said later on you would have to turn down more money, and it worries you. Does that worry you now? I mean, the we have Kevin Systrom next week. Yeah, billion dollars, hard to turn down. Yeah, that's you know that's um that's that's a, a, a top position to to be in. Like you gotta you gotta really think about what you're doing and where you want to go. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't. I wonder if we have those discussions again. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, speaking of Facebook. When they launched places, people thought it was the death knell of you guys because yeah. people were already on Facebook. Surely you could check in. Mm -hmm. How worried were you? I would say that was one of the toughest days of the company. Um, when when you know uh, we Facebook, we were talking a lot with them in 2010, and then um, and then they announced they're going to launch something in September, and I think it was around the time of the announcement, and it was a TechCrunch story, and everyone in the office was like reading the story. And people were kind of second guessing. Oh my God, should we, should we have sold? What what what, what happened? And um, I remember I had to, I had to get up in front of everyone in front in front of like curbed and everyone because we all shared office space <laughs> together. And I was like, Foursquare, stop reading TechCrunch. Like the only, like seriously, don't. This is madness. The only way that we beat these guys and that we own this space is if everyone stops reading the blogs and just builds the stuff that we want to do. Right. Build the stuff that we've been talking about all this time, the stuff that's on the whiteboard. And that's the only, like, we're the only people that are going to build this. There's going to be a ton of people that look at what we're doing and pull apart the pieces that they think are interesting. And they're going to assemble their own Frankenstein version of Foursquare. And we're just going to do the thing that we think we can do well, mm -hmm. which is those SQL statements, which is radar, which is like game mechanics for motivation, merchant tools. And, you know, we, we built all that stuff. But like having to like rally people at that moment and be like, you know, just cut it out and focus on what you're doing because it's the only way that we get through this, like, together. I was like, it's a cool moment to look back on. Mm -hmm. And everyone kind of did it. And we all rallied around it. We were, like, 15 people at the time. And, you know, we kind of look back at it, nostal like, nostalgically now. But that was that was tough. Like, you know, like, we, in the first year, we had everyone trying to kill us, Looped and Gowalla and Scavenger. In the second year, we had, um, you know, we had Facebook and then Google Places. And then, I mean, it's, like, it's just it's just ongoing. And, you know, one of the things that's worked well for us is, like, you know, you can, um, and I've had, to, I've had to learn this because I, I've definitely gotten distracted by what other companies are doing. You're looking at the shiny toys that they make, and I'm like, oh my God, look at that thing. It's so cool. Um, and, you know, we just got to, you got to always look like, like a month ahead, right, of where, you're, of where you are now, and you just got to keep running for that. And like, if you turn around and look at the other guys or turn to the side and look what they're doing, you just get distracted. When you get distracted, you start like thrashing around. And when you start thrashing around, like everyone becomes dismotiv like unmotivated and like you start wasting time and things just get screwed up. And mm -hmm. like we've like we've we've had that happen a bunch of times. And mm -hmm. like we're much more disciplined about it now. So when you had to stand up and give that speech, like did you believe what you were saying or were you scared? I you know, it's a 50-50. You know, it's it's <laughs> like I mean, it's like, hey, we made this decision, we gotta stick by it, this is what we're gonna do. Like I honestly believe that we could we could um you know that that we could make better products than anyone else, but it's tough to compete with companies that are that are really large like that. Well, the best product doesn't always win. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, I, that, that's true. But um, you know, when you're building the when you're building what you think is the best product, it's like I don't want to live in a world where this doesn't exist. You know, like that's why we ended up building the stuff. You know, taking some of the the dodgeball ideas and rebuilding them. It's like. I, I didn't want to do that. I was thinking like, oh, I'll just use these other things that are out there and these these other guys have figured it out. And I looked at those, this is back in like 2008, and I was like, these these tools aren't good. Like, we can build something better than this. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to get over that hump of like, just build it. Like, who cares if it's the same thing? Just build it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just got totally off topic, but... Um, no, you're fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So going forward, what are, what are we going to see from Foursquare? Is the product itself mostly baked, and the, it's going to be the merchant tools that you focus on from now on? No, the, the product is nowhere near baked. Like the product, we could work on it for another five years and ten years, and probably not be there. Like the version of Foursquare that you guys have in your pocket is different than the ones that you had six months ago, and the one that you'll have in your pocket in December is different than the one you'll have now as well the one you'll probably have in like April, like we're just mm -hmm. gonna keep changing it. Um, and I think that's the important thing. It's like we haven't, we haven't found the thing that makes this stuff work. And every time, 
the new, like a new handset comes out, it changes the game. It's like, oh man, the battery's pretty good here and the geofencing works. It's time to dust off that radar stuff and get it working again, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's like, it's, it's only gonna, like, it's only gonna get better. Like you think about what we can do with the API and all the other places that Foursquare data could live, you know? Like, does it live in the, on the screen of your in-car navigation system when you put your car in park? Like, yeah, put a whole bunch of dots on the map, you know? Like this whole idea of just social mapping in general, that stuff doesn't exist. Like no one's, no one's doing that. Like we are the guys that are, inventing that future mm -hmm. and um it just we're just going to keep reinventing it mm -hmm. until we find the stuff that we think you know tens and millions of people are psyched about do you look forward to a day do you need to get to the point where your grandmother's using foursquare my well my grandmother's not a lot unfortunately my mother is using foursquare my um i don't know how i'm gonna get my my grandmother asked me should i buy an iphone and i was like that's a whole different level of tech support for me. <laughs> so I was like, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, Gam. <laughs> um, you know, she, I have a hard enough time with the iChat and her, and that has like one big button. Um, and, uh, you know, but my, my mom is on, uh, my mom's on Foursquare. And I, I mean, everyone's mom is on the stuff that they make. But, you know, my, my mom tells me the story. She's like, I'm at the racquetball court, and some woman comes up to me about how she's saving money at the places that she goes to in rural Massachusetts for using Foursquare. Like, tell your, tell your son I said thank you because he saved me, like, $20 last month. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. <laughs> like, people, like, that's, that's starting to happen now. It's like, yeah. how does Foursquare spread to, the, like, the rest of the world, the people outside of this room, the people outside the tech elite? It's like, the app saves people money, right? That might not be the most important thing for everyone in this room. Maybe it is, whatever. Yeah. But, like, those Amex deals are working great. Like, it, and, and, like, when you, when you can show value to people like that, like, that's, they want to use it and they get mm -hmm. behind it. And, like, the people that are using the app now are people that we never expected would use it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, we see it dipping down into college kids. We see it dipping up into, like, my parents, mm -hmm. like, parents that like their friends. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's cool. How screwed is Groupon? Um, I, you know, I don't really have a lot of insight into what they're doing. I, I just, I haven't played, I saw the POS that they, that they launched. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I haven't, I haven't played with it so much. So I, I'd like to, you know, um, at least give, like, some of their new stuff a look. But. I mean, but you, you got to have some thoughts on the company. I mean, they're directly in your space. They came out of nowhere. I don't, I don't know. They were the, considered the, so much bigger. They go race to an IPO, and you know now they're struggling. Yeah, I mean, they're they're not doing the same stuff we're doing. I think they were at a time. Like, the, we're not doing anything with iPads and restaurants, and you know, if people take it because it saves them money. If that's how Foursquare grows, I mean, that sounds awfully similar to how Groupon grew. It's, I mean, it's it's part of that, but it's like. It's social, it's local, it's utility. Mm -hmm. I think there's overlap. I mean, there's overlap between all these companies. But, um, you know, are they, are they our number one direct competitor? I'm not sure of. So I, I haven't played with their new stuff yet. I'd love, to, I'd love to play with it. And I haven't seen what they've been doing on the mobile stuff for a while. So I have to take another look at that. Who is your number one direct competitor? Um, you know, it's, I think a lot of people peg it as, as Yelp, mm -hmm. right? A lot, I think a lot of people look at, um, look at Yelp and they're like, oh, well, Yelp has this space locked up. What you describe with Explore and Discovery around you is what I use Yelp for, and to some degree, actually, Open Tables mobile app. Yeah, well, I, I think I think like you know the, the big players are our competitors. I look at what Google's doing. Google's got amazing scale and distribution with Android, and like they, they've got they've got some killer products. They just don't have the social part now. Mm -hmm. like, they're not going to beat us on the social map. Like that's that's something we can do really well. But they're really You're good. Not in the worried about stuff. Google Plus? Um, no, I think you know like if it if it really starts taking off. I mean, but like who has an Android phone? Raise your hand. All right, keep, keep your hands tests. up if you had it. Okay, that's, really? That's, I was hoping for more. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, like... Google's probably hoping for more, too. Yeah, well, it's like, <laughs> when we do this next year, there'll probably be a lot more hands that go up. Like, that's a tremendous distribution platform for them. Um, you know, so look at what they're doing. Like, and I look at, you know, Yelp. Yelp has a lot of mind share. There's people here that probably do, you know, probably do Yelp searches instead of Foursquare searches. And, um, like, that's, you know, that's, that's where we're starting to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have an advantage still being private? I mean, certainly being public gives Yelp resources. Uh, yeah, well, I think, I mean, we're, I, I don't think the private versus public thing is the advantage. It's that, like, we are, we are inventing the future of, of local search. Mm -hmm. Like, there's not a lot of companies that are, that are doing that. Like, I think those guys, um, you know, like, they, they beat city search. Like, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the claim to fame. And like we are inventing the like we are inventing local search around big data. Like those things are that's really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And like we're we're a mobile first company. Like if you go look at like if you look at um you know their numbers, for example, like you'll see like you know, you look at the, the quarterly earnings, they have seven point two um 
you know, monthly average, uh, m- monthly users on the Yelp app. And like, we have more people using Foursquare than that. Mm-hmm. And no one talks about that. It's like, no, people don't think about that. They think of the Yelp website. And, um, you know, we think about what we're doing on mobile, all the stuff that we're doing, all the stuff we're doing with radar, all the stuff we're doing with, um, with merchants and passive. It's like, we are, we are, we are going to blow up the space in a way that, um, that, that just, you know, build these products that people haven't seen yet. And it's like, I think by doing what we're doing, we're going to end up like just changing that space and making the other players kind of irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, you guys have been mentioned whenever there's a roundup of like, how is Marissa going to save Yahoo? And is she going to buy companies? You guys get thrown in there. Do you see any scenario where you, in, you sell to Yahoo in the near future? Um, I, I mean, I don't know enough about what their strategy is. Right? So they had a good strategy you'd sell? No, it's like, I mean, we, it's more, um, it's probably more reasonable that like we will, like we, we would work together in the same way that like, Hey, I'd love to be working with Google. Uh, you know, we, we do, we're, we're pretty close with the Facebook guys when we work with them on a lot of the open graph stuff. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe there's a chance for us to end up working with, with some of the Yahoo guys, but I mean, I, I don't know what their strategy around mobile is. I'm like, we'll, you know, or local. So we'll, we'll keep no one's that. calling you. No, I mean, we, we talk to all these folks, right. But like, it's like, it's, it's not like there's like, uh, you know, like these secret discussions going on. So it's like, this is the other thing, right? Everyone, um, everyone talks to everyone else and everyone uh-huh. gets so freaked out. Like, oh, I saw you talking to someone from Facebook in the coffee shop. And I'm like, yeah, everyone talks to everyone else. Like I talk to the Twitter guys and the Facebook guys and sometimes the Groupon guys and sometimes the Yahoo guys and the Square guys. And it's just, that's, that's how we, we all, like this is how stuff gets done. So mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, one more, one more thing, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. If you have a question, where are we? What are we doing? Passing around a mic? Okay. So we have a question. Uh, just be thinking about it. And there's some lady, gorgeous, gorgeous ladies in the back of the room who have mics. Um, so, okay, this is probably going to piss you off. Um, so, so this, this is the one. Yes. Okay. This is the one. I was warned that there was one question that was going to piss me off. <laughs> I've been waiting for the whole time. Nothing's pissed you off so far, right? No. So, so it's true to my you word. Can't, you can't see my rage? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There were some hair issues. Yeah. Earlier. Is it still going on? No, no. Or... No, you just made it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, that is going to drive Kim crazy. Um, okay. So I want to ask you broadly about, um, about li- li- liquidation of shares and cashing out and secondary markets yeah. and how you guys have viewed that. And the particular story that I heard about Foursquare yeah. was that there was a guy who was, you know, a fairly senior level guy who wasn't working out very well, who you guys got rid of. And about the same time, there was a kind of stupid rich man in New York who really wanted to get some shares of a hot up and coming internet company, knew nothing about the space, found out something about Foursquare, somehow got hooked up with this guy who had just been fired from Foursquare. I believe it was around the time you were doing your Series C. Yeah. And basically said, well, what was the valuation of the Series C? And someone told him, and he said, so how about if I pay you three times that? Like, he had no idea how this worked. Bought out this guy's shares. News trickled back to Foursquare. There wasn't a lot of allowance for liquidity among the employees. And the employees were furious because this douchebag who had been fired just got cashed out triple times while the guys still working at the company weren't. Okay, so what's the question? So the, the question, question is, first of all, is, is any of that true? Well, I mean, like, it, it's just, this is much less exciting, because I, I can't comment on that stuff. You know? So I can just say, like, <laughs> I, I can't comment on that story, and I can't tell you anything about that. All right, so let's assume that part of it is true, because yeah. I, mean, I know for a fact it is. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, um, There's yeah, probably I mean, embellishment around the edge. But I'm, you know, I'm not allowed to talk about stuff like that. So, all right. So let's let's talk generally about your view of how entrepreneurs should navigate this because I do think it's a serious question. Yeah. Facebook was way too open with this, and it caused a lot of problems for the company. Yeah. Twitter's been criticized for Dick, you know, basically saying you don't have a right to cash out your shares before we go public. Yeah. How do you guys view it? How do we what? How do you view it? Well, I mean, it can, you know, without going into the way that, that we do this specifically, like that can that can screw up uh, companies, right? So. If you've got people that are that are selling, um, you know, that are selling their shares on on secondary markets, like you guys know that there's like the 500 shareholder rule, which I think is getting is it changed or is getting changed? It's getting changed. Yeah, so that that's that's, that's one way that stuff happens, and then it also just like it creates this weird culture of you know some people are selling because they're not into it, or they got a good price, and some people, you know, may have gotten rich and they become demotivated. I mean, like there's you know, fortunately we have not had to deal with issues like this, um, which which is good because I think like we've been able to watch how other companies have handled this. This is one of the advantages of not going 
second, but going like fifth of a lot of big companies that have done stuff like this. And we can see what's worked well for, for some companies and what hasn't worked. And we've been able to put um, uh, you know, a specific plan and structure around um, that makes sure that like, none of the bad stuff that can come out of secondary offerings actually like, would, would affect our company. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think it's, I think the interesting question is for people that are starting now, starting companies now, like, do they put a clause into the employment agreement for employee number one? That's like, you cannot sell your shares on secondary markets. And I, I don't know what the, like, what the trendy answer for that is right now. What would um, you do if you were doing this for the third time? I, I, well, I don't know. It's tough because like, at some point, like, you, you, you know, it, it's fair, like when you're asking people to give up a lot to you know, work at a startup and maybe take a really crappy salary and work long hours and like take this big risk and leave your, your, your really cushy job at Facebook or Google, like that's asking a lot of people. And especially as people like, you know, um, you know like, uh, people are, um, you know, they, they want to buy a house, they're having a baby, they want some um, stability. Like it's hard to take away that, that option from someone, um, but you want to you want to protect the company, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like it's a it's a tricky thing. If I was if we were doing it with another company, it'd be something that I'd wrestle with because as a founder, like yeah, I'd want the flexibility, but I'd want you know you think oh I'll just lock up the employees, but that's like that's not fair. You can't play by a set, you can't have separate rules for executives and employees. Like that's not cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's a that's a tricky thing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. If any of you guys are wrestling with that, like it's definitely worth. Um, you know, reaching out to some folks in the law community, um, you know, to see to see where uh, like where people stand on it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's go to some questions from the audience. Anyone? There's a guy up here, Ani. There's okay. Go. No, I'm not saying you have to go to this guy. Because <laughs> the tape. Uh, you mentioned that you are um, behind your. Uh, obsession with Foursquare and everything you're doing with Foursquare was a maybe a larger or higher level uh, passion for so software for cities. Yeah. Um, obviously, you're, you're, you said also that you're you're not nearly done with Foursquare. There's a lot you're going to do with Foursquare. Do you see? Are there other things that fit in that bus in that bucket? Sort of software to improve software life in cities uh, or... that you're not going to do with Foursquare. Where are the big opportunities for for software in cities that oh. you're not doing? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I think Uber is nailing one. Like, I would never have saw the Uber opportunity, but like, that's Uber is awesome. Like, that's a that's pretty amazing. Um, you know, people have been playing around with the strangers meeting strangers space for a while. Like, how do I, you know, if I'm a single guy, how do I go meet the appropriate single girl who is like in this room or in this neighborhood? Like, I think that that stuff is kind of interesting. Um, the whole market of um, of you know, I have a I have a skill that you need, or you have a skill that I need, and how do you connect those people mm -hmm. in neighborhoods? Like that's that's coming along. Uh, local the dissemination of local news um, uh, in neighborhoods, right? Like microblogging around communities. I think that stuff's really interesting. And I you know New York is a great place for a lot of the stuff to start, and you actually see a lot of that stuff happening here because um, it's just like a really challenging environment to uh, to build for, and it's a really like there's just a lot of opportunities to build that stuff. Do you angel invest at all? Do you angel invest in any of those kind of? Yeah, things? I've made a bunch of a bunch of angel investments. Um, nothing really in that in that space. Um, it's mostly a lot of the angel investments have been in in, um, in friends of mine that I know who I think are brilliant that are that are doing their own things. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. So you mentioned briefly about your API, and I was wondering what's happened recently with Twitter and how they grew a lot by keeping their API open, and then kind of reined it back in a little bit, what your thoughts are. I know right now there's a lot of cool things connecting to Foursquare. Do you see that only growing, or what are your thoughts moving forward? Yeah, um, you know, I, it, it's one of those things, like, where I think when you're on the outside and you look at, you look at them like, oh, gosh, how can they make these decisions? But, you know, it, like, I, I don't know what, what goes on in the strategy meetings there, but, you know, you can kind of empathize with, like, oh, that they're, they're probably – it really pains them to make those decisions and they have to do it to, you know, to protect their core business. Um, you know, we, we haven't really had to face a lot of those issues with, uh, with Foursquare. I think, um, you know, for, we, we saw people misusing our API and misusing like the who's here feature of it. And so we made some changes to our API, um, you know, so that like to restrict it a little bit. And so we had to make the decision, hey, is our app allowed to play by different rules 
than other people's apps, and we decided that was not a good policy for the APIs. So like we play by the same rules as everyone else in the in the ecosystem. Uh, and so that's been that's probably been our biggest our biggest API challenge. But um, I, I don't know what the future holds. I, you know, if you ask me again in a year, I bet there's there's other other things that like we're we're struggling with. But it hasn't been a huge thing for us so far. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, you, you mentioned the point where you rallied with 15 members on your, on your team a while back when you know, Facebook was starting its products, and Google was starting its products. <clears throat> My question is, you know, after you rallied that team successfully and you grew that team from 15 people to 150 people, how did you find the right people to grow from there? From 15 to 150? It's... um. I don't know. It's it's tricky. It's like you gotta. It's it's by having good, strong people um, in those leadership positions that we're responsible for hiring. You know where we got a lot of benefit is, um, you know, uh, Harry was a, you know, I was ex Google and Harry was an ex Google as was Alex. And is anyone here work at Google? Like Google? No. Google teaches you like Google teaches you how to work at a big company. Like how like. We picked up a lot of processes, a lot of like management tricks. Like it teaches you how to interview, um, teaches you how to evaluate the people that you interview as a group afterwards. Like that, that's that stuff you don't. I don't think you learn that in business school. Like you just learn that by working at Google. And we, you know, by being ex Googlers, we hired a lot of the, those are the people that we knew. Like we we used, we joke around about like we hired our lunch table, and it took us about eight months to get everyone. But one of the time we recruited each of those each of those folks away. And like they all work at Foursquare. And so they're like, yeah, we know how to interview people. We know what the interview process looks like. They just they know what A players look like. And A players want to work with A players. And like it just happens that we have a lot of A players at, at Foursquare. And so I think that you know this is kind of like maybe 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 obvious, but it's um, you know, good good people want to work with good people. And like once you once we started building that, we had a it's like a magnet effect. Where people hear about, oh, Foursquare's engineering group, like they are rock stars. I want to go work with them. And like I, I didn't believe that to be true. I was like, oh, people don't think like that, but that's how engineers think. And that, that it, it's been working well for us in New York. It's been working well for us in San Francisco. Were there any tips on how to interview that you can share? Um, it's you know not not so much for en engineers. Like right. for for me personally. Like when we interview people, it's usually an all-day thing, you know, and like it's not uncommon for people to go through six or eight different interviews with six or eight different people. I like to sit down with people and ask them about all the other products in the industry, and to see like how they see our strategy weaving out of what other in what what other people could do. Because so I like to see how they can think about like you know our space, what are our weaknesses, what are our strengths, like what what could Facebook fumble on, what could Google crush us on that we're not seeing. Like I, I, that that's what's important to me because I like having those types of conversations with people. And I think those you know people that can can talk about that stuff can make really good product decisions on their own. Okay. Um, just one more thing, yeah, real sure. quick. Uh, we're hiring all the time, right? <laughs> we are hiring in New York for everything. We are hiring in San Francisco for everything. So foursquare.com/jobs. <laughs> How big will you be this time next year? Uh, has any any of you guys been to our office? No. Yeah. Okay. Oh, awesome. So we have uh, we took two floors in the New York office. In the upstairs, we just we built some walls and we subletted it to startups, and um, you know we took two floors because we know we're going to need those floors, and it's starting to get a little tight at Foursquare. So I don't know what the number is going to be. We have about um, maybe 120 people in New York, and I think we can fit 140 on on that first floor before we have to start moving upstairs. Um, so that like I, I, I you know I don't know what the number is, but significantly larger, and it depends on how quickly you can hire, which is why all you guys should go to foursquarecom jobs. <laughs> One of the best websites on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, if any, and if any of you don't want to work at Foursquare, but you're an amazing reporter, then you should email me because we need those. All right. Is it all? Okay. So I have three questions for you, very direct questions. Let's do this. Uh, <laughs> Lightning round. <laughs> yeah. Lightning round, yes. Uh, the question, the first question is, do you see Foursquare making any acquisitions over the next maybe year, couple of years? That's number one. Yeah. Number two is, in terms of your focus, where is it going to lie? Is it going to fall on the monetization side of Foursquare or is it still going to be on the product side? And then the third question is, uh, how are merchants signing up for Foursquare? Right? How, how are they using, uh, how are they coming online? Right. Uh, how are they onboarding? Yeah. Like, so how are you onboarding yeah. merchants? Right. Okay. 
Uh, question number one was uh, acquisitions. Oh, acquisitions. Yeah, like that's the way that um, companies that are our size continue to grow very quickly. Is instead of acquire, you know, instead of acquiring one person at a time, you can acquire teams. We haven't done that yet. Like we've had conversations um, with people about it. It would probably it would be acqui hires because like we just we want to build the team very quickly, um, and we haven't been able to find um, a team where where it makes sense yet. So the, the answer um, the answer is yeah, I do see us doing that. We just haven't done it yet. Question number two was... Um, you spend your time on pro product. You're good at this, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not my time. It's Foursquare's time, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I think one of the things that we did really well, kind of accidentally, is in two, when we, like, in 2009 when the whole, like, Marsh Cafe and the flyers and the monetization plan came out, like, we're like, hey, that should be part of our product. And we would, you know, we'd build two things for users and one thing for merchants and two things for users and one thing for merchants. And, you know, product... The monetization tools, and I feel weird keeping calling that, it's like the merchant tools have always been a core part of the product because, and this is a Ben, ben Horowitz quote, um, he was like, the thing I love most about your company is that the thing that's going to make you money is the thing that the users love. Like they love the specials, the special treatment, saving money, like getting deals. Like that's what, they, they love that about that and that's going to work out for you guys. And so we see it as part of the, the, the core user experience. And so we continue to build that stuff at the same time. You know, it's probably twice as many people, maybe a little bit more than that, that work on um, consumer-facing product that um, then work at merchant-facing product, but like we build them in parallel because we see them as not two separate tracks. It's not like, okay, let's just bolt on the ad tools at the end of the day. It's like, no, these two things are intertwined and they've been intertwined since, you know, since fall of 2009 and they'll be like that forever. Um, and the third one? And will that mix stay the same? The I, yeah, I think so because I think it's, like, it's evolving pretty nicely. That's worked pretty well for us. Like the merchant tools continue to get better, and the user tools get better, and like as new users are getting on, like the merchants are finding new ways to engage with them, mm -hmm. and it's it's just it's working out pretty well. Like I mean, I'm using that the two thirds, one third pretty roughly, right. but like you know that that's the way that it feels. Third was onboarding merchants. Uh, onboarding merchants. Um, you know, in the early days, it came from I'll tell you, it came from a lot of like um, like smart aleck users that would go to a coffee shop and be like, I'm the mayor, what do I get for free? And they're like, what? And then that would happen. <laughs> That would happen like five times. Like, I check in, what do I get? And for better or worse, we kind of conditioned our users to expect something for checking in. And a lot of merchants heard about Foursquare that way. And so they would either check it out or sometimes you get a super user that would go to the, go to the store and be like, oh, no, I'll sign you up right now so that like, every people, everyone can get free coffee. And that worked, that worked well for us. Um, you know, now, like, we've got a million merchants. There's enough people that know about that. So like, you know, when we do, like, we send people to go speak at... Um, like merchant trade shows, like the Restaurant Association of Boston, like to pitch what we're doing, and like that. That's part. That's important for us. Um, you know, when we talk about getting people into that self-service platform, you know, one of the things that's kind of cool is um, like we have stats for all the places that people check in, and so we can basically just send an email to a merchant and be like, "What? You know, you had 300 people check in last week. Wouldn't you like to learn more about those?" They're like. Yeah, of course I would. Wouldn't you like to, you know, be able to get some of those users back? Like, that's really, like, you're not calling people up like, hello, would you like to give a deal for free? It's like, we have the numbers. You had 300 people check in last week, and you had 270 people the week before, and you had 400 the week before that. You want to find a way to engage with those users. And, like, that's, that, it's like a really, um, it's like a compelling pitch for them. Um, but, you know, again, like, we'll see if, as we ramp up our sales efforts how, how successful we are with that. Okay, Is that a good answer? Okay. Who has, who has Mike next to you? Okay. Hi. Um, for the entrepreneurs outside of New York City, what are your top three reasons why they should build their business here? Top three reasons why you should build a business here? Yeah. Um, well, you know, like for for our stuff, I mean, that's just a little bit different for Foursquare because, like, we're building software for cities, so like, hey, this is a good place to try it out. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I, I, I mean, going back to what I was saying before, it's like there's a lot of people that don't care about the tech scene in New York, and I think that's good for the tech scene. Because you know you get input from from real folks, and you you know and and you can beta test on a real community that is not just a pool of early adopters. The second thing is like you know we are a mile away from the New York Times and a mile away from Madison Avenue, and so we need to talk to advertisers. Like we don't get on a plane, we don't get on the phone. I just ride my bike up there, um, <laughs> and it's a, you know it's the same thing like with with a lot of the journalists. Like the journalists, the bloggers, like people are covering stuff in New York anyway, and so you know we can take advantage of that. Um, the third thing is, um, you know, and let me see, uh, reasons why it's, here, here's the thing, it's like, the, the tech scene has like some traction now. Like I was joking about this the other day, but it used to be that like, the, the, the smarty pants kids from Boston, um, you know, Harvard and MIT kids, they get on a plane and just go right to Silicon Valley with their diploma. And now it's like, they, get, they think about it, like, oh, should I go to New York? New York is a really cool city, that'd be a really fun place to live. Um, or should I go to San Francisco? And so that, that's only gonna, 
like we've already gone through the days where that was hard, and it's only going to get better for you know engineering talent in New York. Like one of the best things that's happened to the New York tech scene is Google having their office here, and they opened up this office with like you know I remember they said like a thousand like, they're never going to get a thousand engineers, and now it's like there's thousands of engineers that are working on consumer facing you know web applications that are that are in Google New York, and like they've they've cha- like that's probably the biggest thing to happen in in, in New York City tech. And um, you know, once they put their kind of their stake in the ground, like we all get to reap the benefits of that. Great. Mysterious question. Just one last, <laughs> one last uh, part. Do you think the city is doing enough for the startups in the city? Uh, yeah, I think. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, like the Bloomberg administration has been really supportive of what we're doing here. Like with the the big apps contest, um, you know, Rachel Stern has been a great liaison between startups in the city. Um, you know, just just putting like when Bloomberg comes to our office and goes visit and he goes to visit Tumblr or invites us to events, like that's like that's him putting a stamp of approval that like you guys are doing something good and people should pay attention to it. And you know, and, and that's 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 great. You know, that's 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 really it's really good for New York. Um, and I think well, like it, it's hard to see what's happening in the moment, but you know, you look out two years later and it's like if, if they're still paying as much attention to what we're doing and why it's important, like that's. It's, I mean, that's only going to pay benefits in the future, I think. All right, great. I have a question related to a previous question. Um, I've been coding for maybe about a week and a half, and I had to move yeah. from DC to here to be able to learn to do that. Um, what do you think it takes for communities around the country to grow, for the tech communities around the country to grow? Because I feel like DC has nearly none of that, and the city definitely could benefit from it. I mean, you've seen New York change. You've seen New York community change. You've seen Silicon Valley. And I mean, they had generations of that going yeah. on. And I mean, being local, being a part of the community, uh, doing good for that community is, really, is very important. So what do you think it takes for you know, tech communities to sprout in other cities besides New York and San Francisco? Well, it's, it's, like a, it's a support network, right? So you know, the problem that we have with Dodgeball is you know, I had no one to show a pitch deck to and say, is this good or is this bad? I had no one to practice on. I had no VCs to talk to. I had no one to warm up with, you know? Um, and even if we were to get funding, I had no one to, like, mentor me. Uh, and, like, it just didn't exist. And I think once that starts to happen, and, and I, in New York it happens when a couple people end up having tech exits, and you get, like, some of those folks get enough money that they start investing in their friends' things, and they start helping out, and they spend extra time, like, giving a talk at Columbia or you know, spending time with people at the New York Tech Meetup. Like, that, that's how it happens. It happens very slowly. Like, we're, what is it, what year is it, 2012? Like, you know, it's, this has been going on for, I mean, I moved to New York in 98, and it's like, it's a thousand times, well, yeah, it's, it's a thousand times better than it was in, like, 2001. Is it as good as it was in, like, 1998? I'm not really sure because I don't have a lot of perspective on it. But, like, yeah, it's definitely easier now than even was, like, two years ago. And as long as this community keeps giving back, through like you know coffee meetings and New York Tech Meetup presentations and like you know helping each other out like that's what we do it's it um like it just happens and so how that, does it happen in a new city I, I don't I don't know what the magic formula is I think it's just like a community forms you know you see it in London Silicon Roundabout all the startups get in an incubator space and then they outgrow that space and then they're all in the same neighborhood and then they outgrow that neighborhood and then the city builds like incubators for them and like you know that it's starting to happen there but it takes time so so uh. In addition to loving Foursquare, I, uh, I love Seamless. And I have these moments where I find a place on Foursquare and I think, you know, shit, I wish I could push that button and Seamless this thing. Yeah. So uh, there's obviously some natural parallels. What are, what are thoughts about direct commerce? What types of conversations do you have around that? Is that something that's out of the question? Um, yeah, I mean, we just did something with Open Table, right? Because yeah. like we're driving people to places, and some of those places is a wait. We need a reservation. We should we should do that. Yeah. You know, um, I think the seamless stuff is probably on a whiteboard somewhere. Like I don't know if it's like a core fit to the product, but like one of the things that we've done on the API is we have this thing called connected apps, and connected apps allows people to build the little apps that live inside of Foursquare. So if you wanted to build the seamless web app, it's like when you go and look at a, a venue page or when you check into a place. And you would want to order from Seamless Web, you, you, would, you, know, you would be able to put that button in our app that would then be able to drive you or drive anyone that installed that app to then take advantage of that stuff. And so that's the way I think of that. Yeah. You know, it's like hey, pe- the people have the ideas that are a lot better than some of the ideas that we have or a lot different than the ideas that we have. And we want them to be able to build that stuff in there. So I don't think it's something that we would do, but if someone wanted to build it, I'd be psyched. 
Uh, you use course. Uh, you use uh, restaurants and cafes a lot in terms of examples of uh, places that are great for recommendations within within Foursquare, um, within the app itself. Being that you know Google somewhat recently bought uh, Zagat, uh, which is you know an excellent resource for restaurants and cafes across uh, the world. Does that concern you at all any more than when Facebook entered the check-in space, uh, especially with Google Plus and them moving towards mobile and how the potent, how they could potentially tie that in with uh, Zag with their Zagat acquisition. Yeah, it's, it turns into a question of um, we hear that Hari Krishna is outside. It's oh, like, is that what that is? I think so. Yeah, or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it turns into a question of like which data is more interesting. You know, like Zagat is really really good data. Like it's it's, it's, it's it, it, really interesting data points there. But you know, like the thing that we're doing that no one else is really doing is like we have that we have the check-in data. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people have, it's funny, because it's funny the number of people that poo-poo the check-in data, but, you know, it's like, which people go to which places repeatedly, you know, which, peop which people go to which places, you know, like, on a Tuesday morning versus a Thursday afternoon, when it's at abnormally warm out, when it's, like, you know, unseasonably cold out, like, we can, you know, which, which people check in um, together at multiple places, or how do you string check-ins together, like, I was here, then here, then here, then here. Or after I went to this place, I never went to this place again. Or after this place, I will started going to this place regularly. Like, we've got three million, three million, we almost have three billion dots. And we've got to find all the different ways to connect those dots. And I think that data is better than the data that anyone else has. And so, like, yeah, it's cool to look at their, you know, they've got short form reviews for thing and they've got the rating data. But, like, you know, man, we, I think we can do stuff that no one else can do, which is why I always say, like, we're reinventing what local search is going to look like. You know, like that. I mean, I think the biggest point here is like we all open up those apps, like, and we all search for you know sushi or tacos or you know beer right now. We all get the same results. Like that is broken. It's very clearly broken. You know, the Foursquare approach is everyone gets different results based upon the things that they've done in the past, all the inputs, what your friends have done. That is very clearly going to be the way that this works. And like that's the thing that we are knee deep in solving. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh Thank you for coming. Uh, you mentioned the <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> well, technically, I traveled farther. Sorry. Well, thank you for coming as well. Being a great moderator. Um, you talked about the ups and downs, even in the day-to-day -day basis, is still the point that you're at. How do you, as an entrepreneur, uh, stay like focused and like keep going? Is there something you tell yourself? Is there like a trick you have that you could share, maybe? <laughs> um, the uh, I think it's it's like don't don't take it personally. You know, it's it's that sounds kind of cliche also, but like just let the stuff roll off of you. Um, if you get if you keep all this stuff bottled up, it's um it'll drive you crazy. You know, and if you can't celebrate the things that you've done, like that'll drive you crazy too. And so, um, you know, what the you know what, one of the things I do is like I try I'm working all the time, um, but I try not like one of my tricks is like I try not to use my laptop on weekends. Right? I, oh, here's another thing. Like, exercise. Just, like, exercise. It sounds lame. Like, exercise a couple times a week, and it totally clears your head. And, like, I find when I don't do that, I go crazy. When I do do that, I'm much more calm, right? And it's like, it's just, it's like the advice you'd get out of, like, a self-help book or something. But it's, um, you just can't, you can't live in your head too much. I'll tell you, Ben Horowitz has an awesome blog post on the psychology of a CEO. And if you guys haven't read that, that is your homework assignment right after this, is to read that blog post. And actually read, like, the top ten... On, the, on his blog, on the left-hand side, is like the top 10 post, and they're all awesome. And that, that's the one that I actually, I, I go back to that occasionally when I'm having a bad day, and I'm like, all right, get, like, get it together and read this, out, like, read this through and just you know, put it all in perspective. I the, speaking of Ben's blog post, the, one of the best compliments I've gotten since building this company is um, Ben's daughter was an intern for us over the summer. And yeah. so, you know, a couple weeks in, Ben was sort of like, you know, over breakfast, like kind of pumping her for information on, you know, how things really were going for us. And, um, you know, this is sort of early summer, so we're still kind of finding our sea legs. And he was like, so, so what is, what is it like working for Sarah? Like, what's really going on there? Cause, she, cause it comes out of my house. She's coming to my house every day with like the yeah. baby yeah, and yeah. I'm hiring and firing and breaking stories and it's insane. Um, and she said, well, dad, this is like 18 year old Sophia. Well, dad, you know, your post about the wartime CEO and the yeah. peacetime CEO. And he was like, yeah. And she was like, Sarah is completely a wartime CEO. Yeah, that's, I, it's, that's another one of these, these good ones. I have that I open in my post. browser window right now, and it's been up there for like four days. And I go back, and I mean, it's this weird. I go back and I, I read it every couple of days because it's like, all right, get motivated. This is what we're doing. Like, don't, don't screw up this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, like, you know, the, the, 
just to kind of one more answer to your question, it's um, you you talk to other people that have gone through it. You realize that every like every company is just as screwed up as your company, and um, every company has good days and bad days, and um, you know you, you're like everyone's kind of going through the same thing, and it's never like no one is ever just roses all the time. And it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. And I think once you just embrace the fact that like, you can't keep up with everything, you can't do everything, everything's not going to be perfect, and you just got to do your best to kind of keep your, keep your head above water and keep pushing things forward. Like, once you kind of embrace that, it, it gets easier. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. She told me to stand up, so I'm going to stand up. <laughs> so just a random question. Uh, it's always awesome to see entrepreneurs do what they want to do and they're so passionate about. What would you be doing today if you weren't working on Foursquare? And like what tech startup would I be doing? Or I mean, any job. other ideas or stuff you're passionate about? Like Jack Dorsey always wants to be the mayor of New York City. <laughs> so what would you want to do? Oh, I'd probably be a snowboard instructor. Like that was, <laughs> that was my job before dodgeball. And so I, would, uh, I, I enjoy doing that. Um, you know what? I also, I, 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 um, when I had more time, I used to um, do a lot of prototypes for like how to make TV better and social TV. It's like I'm a big fan of what the guys at Boxy are doing. And I think if I if I wasn't do if I wasn't knee deep in like mobile social location, I would probably be playing in that space. I, I like that stuff a lot. But I have a feeling by the time I have more time to play in that space, someone will have already figured it out, and then I'll have to go find something else to do. All right. Are there any other microphones out? Okay. This guy has a question. Let's make this the last question. I think it's take a team effort to get you the microphone. <clears throat> okay. So. You know, you've said it, and and you said it in the past as well. Like it's all about the check-in. That's what drives everything. But like, are all check-ins created equal? Is there some sense of like emotional sentiment that is more present when you check into places like a bar with friends as opposed to like I check into the grocery store? Yeah, like yeah. Me, I never check into the grocery store anymore because I don't want that to affect my recommendations. Because I don't want you to tell me like, hey, there's a sweet grocery store nearby. <laughs> so, so like, how do you know when? We discount that stuff, by the way. So okay. you should, you, it's funny. That's a good point. Like, you you are expressing a concern that I haven't heard yet. And as soon as over, I'm going to write this down in my little notebook. So I remember. Thank you. It's a good thing um, we did one more question. Yeah, I know. This guy is like <laughs> saving. The save, uh, uh, oh my God! It's holding on fire. Um, no, but that's that we've we've been debating this, right? And so we're debating it as like, okay, well, should the check-in be super fast, or should the check-in, you know, be a little bit slower and ask you for a photo and ask you for a shout? Is it, what would we rather have? 10 million check-ins each with photos? Or, I'm sorry, 10 million check-ins with no photos? Or 4 million check-ins with photos, right? And so those are things that we're actively debating. Um, and it's tough because then, then you kind of have to, then you're telling people how you want them to use Foursquare. And that's, where it, gets, that's where, it get, where it gets tricky because you want people just to be able to use it any way they want. They want to check in every gas station or train station because they want the points and the badges and the membership. Like, they should be able to do that. We shouldn't make it hard. But at the same time, you know, you, you don't want all those check-ins to clog up the stream so that it gets really annoying for folks. So I don't have a really good answer for your question. And I think um, because it's one of the things that we, we debate internally. And it's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. Like, do, you know, as the, as the creators of this product, should we step in and kind of curate the way that we want people to create content? Uh, in the past, we've erred on the side of like, no, the content should be really rich and meaningful. Um, but, you know, as you see more people checking into supermarkets and other places, it's like, you know, does it, does it change the way that people consume content? Does it change the way that people create content? And so it's, it's always an active discussion at the company. And um, I don't have a, a great answer for you, but I think it's an interesting point that you're able to pick up on it, and it is one of the things we think about a lot. I will say this is like, the way you ask the question belies that you live in New York. So I live in the Mission, and then I also spend half my time in downtown Vegas because my husband's working on Tony Shea's crazy yeah. adventure. And neither have a good grocery store. And it's been a major source of anger and frustration for me, like, at both of my homes. So unlike him, I would like sweet grocery store recommendations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please push them to me. So I have to go to Walmart in Vegas. So, all right. All right. See, now, now there's a huge product debate going on up here. I can't wait. This, this is my system, by the way. You're Perhaps people system, with, with young children would like to know about grocery that we, stores. That, um... Yeah, I can I can see it. All right, all right. You can search for it. You can search for grocery store. Anyway, I can't believe we ended this whole talk on, on that what? note. And no, grocery no, stores, peace out. No, no, no. I always get the last two questions. See, this oh. is what I oh, love really? about This is why I, these are so long because okay. no one no one realized, no one watches through the whole thing. And so, like, the last two questions are always a surprise, even though they're always the same. Okay. Um, are these the gotcha, gotcha questions I'm supposed to be mad about? No that, no, that was the one about the guy on. who oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. sold all his shares that you punted on, which is absolutely true. 
Um, so, <laughs> okay, so before I get to these two questions, um, first of all, I want to thank Projective hugely for doing this. This is our first time doing it here. We have really struggled to find um, a venue that you know we could consider home in New York, and you know this event is incredibly expensive for us. It's probably the most expensive thing we do as a startup because in San Francisco, 500 people come and people get this stuff, and we don't have to travel. Yeah. In LA, you know we only do them quarterly, and you know 400 people come. You know in New York, we keep it smaller, and you know we all have to fly out here, and it's more expensive because it's New York. So like we probably lose more money on this event than anything we do, and so Projective like stepped up and gifted us this space, which is incredibly generous. So big hand of applause for Rebecca. Um, and you know, the point is we want to be able to keep doing it and keep the ticket prices low. So it helps you guys too. Um, all right, so next guests we have coming up. In New York, we have another three city month. Uh, sorry, in, in November, we have another three city month. Um, on um, next week, we have Kevin Systrom in, um, in San Francisco. And then November 1st, we have Chris Saka in LA. And then November 8th, if that's a Thursday, whatever the following Thursday is, we have Daniel Eck of Spotify here in New York, okay. um, which is going to be very exciting. I expect that one will, might break your record. Sell it even quicker. Let's see. Daniel's a handsome guy. It's on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll be Bieber hair versus bald. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the week after that, we've got Naval Ravikant in San Francisco of AngelList. So we've got a really awesome November. We're working on the lineup for next year in New York. We're going to do nine in New York next year, so we're working on the lineup now. So um, please tell your friends, continue to buy tickets. Um, we lo I love being able to get here every month and, and have fun in this ecosystem, particularly since there's also media companies in this ecosystem and there's none in the Valley. Yeah. Um, okay, housekeeping being done. Um, what is the one thing you believe that almost no one else believes to be true? What is the one? Th God, you should give these questions to people before. Um, They're on each video. Oh, they are? Yeah. yeah well, I, <laughs> my, my YouTube is broken. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing that I believe to be true that, um, that no one else... Not, that can't be no one, but like, is not necessarily conventional thinking. Is it, I mean, is it too cliche to say like, the belief in the vision of the company that we're like, I don't know if that's like a cop-out answer, but that's the thing. It's like, since we started this thing, people have been telling us that this is not going to work. And like, it, you know, and I, when we started building Dodgeball in like 2000, that's, not, that's a stupid idea. It's never going to work. And we brought it to NYU. That's a stupid idea. It's never going to work. And at Google, we were like, okay, this is not going to work here. And at, um, when we started again, you already tried that. It didn't work. And like, it's just, that, that has been the story of my entire career. The thing that I care most about is not going to work. It's a stupid idea. And like, I don't know, it's, it's going okay so far. And, um, you know, that, that, I think that's been the thing. Like, it's a, it's a really, and I'd say, I, I, I'd love to, um, I should ask this of other, of other folks, but, you know, like, I, I bet you, you know, Zuck went through the same thing and Jack with Twitter. Like, it's that, it's that part where it's like, oh, you're working on this thing, it's just not interesting. You know, like, what is that going to turn into? Um, and you got to see it in a way that other people don't, don't see it. And you just have to be that guy that's like, I don't care what you say, I'm just going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, there's more people that get what we're doing, but there's plenty of people that don't. And I'm sure there's a bunch of people in here that still don't believe it. And, you know, like, I, I find that's like my personal goal is to convince you guys that we can do this better than anyone else. And we can do it in a way that, that that's different, that we invented. And it starts with the check-in stuff that everyone thought was, was silly and stupid. Um, and so that, that's, that's the thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's my answer for that. That's a good answer. Okay. No, mine is that I think you can build a blog at, at not based on page views. So oh, I mean, there I you think go. Okay. frequently people's thing is hopefully what they're doing. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, you gotta, it helps to be really passionate about the thing that you're doing. Otherwise, that's the only way to keep yourself sane about this stuff, you know? Right, right. On the um, days when you want to shoot yourself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every other day, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, last question. If you could have one mediocre superpower in the world, what would it be? One mediocre superpower. Would you like some examples of mediocre superpowers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the poor people who come every time have not heard this example 45 times. The best answer we've ever had to this question is one guy wanted to be able to temporarily detach his arm while spooning with a girl. All right. That's, um, <laughs> I, I who was that? <laughs> it, it was not a panel lunch, I guess. It was someone, it was someone on the panel list. Some other like, I need porn to conference actually remember like, yeah. who it was at some point. Um, but 
But uh, I actually, Jonah Preddy gave one of my favorite ones. Yeah. Um, and and he was he like you did not watch the video, so was not prepared, and I couldn't believe he came up with this on the fly because it's so brilliant. Um, you know, you know, I don't know if you have these at your house, but the toilet seats that kind of slow down and oh, yeah, don't yeah. slam. He wanted to be able to extend that functionality to like to like every object in life. So it's like if he slammed a door, it would automatically slow down. Or like if he was like late for a meeting, he'd cut a slide. And yeah, well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, just off the top of my head, without giving a lot of thought, I um, you know, you know that um that button on your TV that lets you like rewind 30 seconds. It's like the do over button or like the, you know, you can either rewind 30 seconds or skip ahead 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine, I can't imagine why I'd want to skip ahead. I'll take the rewind one though. You mm -hmm. know, that's that like to have a do over on, um, on a certain number of things per day, I think would be helpful. So. Is it to be able to do something better or to relive something or? Well, it's like, it's like groundhog day, right? Like uh -huh. I wonder how that would work out if I played that hand just a little bit differently. You know, I think about that a lot, right? Actually, like, what if you could do the whole day over and over again? Like, what are the things that you would do differently? Like, uh -huh. if we could replay that whole scenario again. And, you know, that's like a, a little mini 30-second version of Groundhog Day. But then uh -huh. you could play it out ultimately until you just figure it out just right. This is interesting since you're the only guy I know who's literally building the same company again. But yeah, <laughs> that's different. It's not different. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm no Freud. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I like that. Uh, we'll give you five. Okay. We have to keep it mediocre. Five, five out of ten. No, like five do-overs. Oh yeah, I was like, I have five out of ten. That was an okay <laughs> answer. <you>. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> the heck? No, I mean you have to you have to limit like like Dustin Moskowitz said he wanted to control the weather on his way to work so that his hair wouldn't get messed up. And I was like, oh. well, you control the weather around your hair. Like there has oh, to be a that's limitation kind of yeah, in yeah. the mediocre part. Yeah, um, maybe mine's too broad. That might be no, too like ambitious yours. superpower. Okay, no, I like yours. The five, you five, a d five, five a day, you get to go back thirty. Yeah, minutes. I could do that. Yeah, because then there's like a little bit of an economy, and you got to save them up a little bit. Yeah. So maybe at the end of the day, you haven't used any. You just enjoy dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really just, you keep time. eating that bite of steak over and over again. <laughs> That's how you put on some additional weight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. This has been really, really fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. For doing thank, this. thank you guys for having me here. Thank you.